Good morning, everyone. Uh, let me say we really do appreciate uh, you all taking time out of your Friday uh, to join us on this webinar. Uh, if you if you enjoy the webinar, uh, let us know. Uh, let your friends know. Share the recording with your colleagues. Uh, if you don't, if you think there are areas that we can improve in, we certainly want you to let us know that. So welcome and let's go, right? Thanks, Dan. Appreciate that. And with us today is Lisa Knopf Owen, the National Watershed Coalition Chair. Lisa? Good morning, everyone, and, and welcome to our webinar, one in a series of many that we've been doing over the past couple of years. I wanted to give you a quick update from the National Watershed Coalition. First off, starting with an a introduction of the officer team that, that works for your organization. Um, my name's Lisa Knopf Owen. I'm the uh, assistant director for the Oklahoma Conservation Commission and am serving as your current chair. Tina Hendon is from uh, Houston, Texas, and she is our vice chair, another Texan, Rex Isom, the uh, executive director of the Texas uh, Conservation Organization is your immediate past chair. Barb is our longtime serving secretary treasurer from Kansas. And of course you all, most of you have seen, talked to or know our executive director, Dr. Dan Siebert. So uh, National Watershed Coalition has kind of a threefold uh, purpose being uh, providing assistance and consultation to our membership, as well as uh, providing informational and educational expertise not only to our membership, but to uh, others that reach out for information, whether that be uh, interested uh, partners or uh, legislators or any number of folks. And then we work very closely uh, with our good partners with USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service through a co cooperative contribution agreement, which is where a lot of the, the information for these webinars and designs uh, for these webinars come through. We have had over the last uh, couple of years, uh, especially through the pandemic, uh, really launched into virtual trainings and meetings. Uh, to date, we've had over eight webinars and that number may have gone up by now, um, reaching over 1500 people. We have our own YouTube channel and we would rec uh, recommend that you subscribe to that. All of these webinars that we've uh, completed and done are loaded up on that channel. And this one will be no different after a couple of days. It will, since it is being recorded, it will be up there as well. So if you click again, Ray, I think that will show some of the different things that we've worked on um, over the past uh, year and a half, where we've had the opportunity. We wouldn't have been able to travel to Indiana, Massachusetts, Kentucky, or the like. Um, to have these uh, conferences in person, um, but because of the technology that we're able to use here, we're able to reach out to more of our membership and our partners. So uh, the other great thing that's occurred over the past six months is our new website is now operational. Um, you can go there to find fact sheets, success stories, um, updated information there. Um, and then also one of the, the new things that I think is very helpful is being able to online event registration as well as payment of accepting payments for membership and dues. So speaking of those, um, it, uh, also we, it is tied directly to our Facebook page. And so we always want you to like us on Facebook. That is where some additional information is always available to you. So you can find us there. And speaking of members, if you like what you see here, um, if you've participated in any of our webinars or trainings in the past, um, we'd encourage you to become an, a member of the National Watershed Coalition. It's a, a small investment for a lot of information that you receive. And uh, as an individual, it's a $25 uh, annual membership that you can pay uh, directly on the website. So with that, just uh, want to talk a little bit about, uh, this is kind of our, our flow chart of how things work. 
is that by providing education and information, um, it creates and sustains a healthier NRCS partnership. Um, we have, it strengthens our project sponsors. Um, it leads to successful projects as well as increases the benefits that each of our members receive, as well as um, the, the benefits that are allowed on the landscape. So with that, I'll turn it back to Ray and Dan, and we can get the webinar kicked off. Thank you so much, Lisa. Are we ready to roll, Ray? We are. Give us the overview, Dan, and we'll, uh, we got a couple more logistics slides and off and running. All righty. Um, we're, uh, we're pretty excited about uh, today's activities. Um, you will meet my friend Paul Schweiger here in a few minutes, and he's invested uh, some significant time in putting together a new set of materials about operation and maintenance and the underpinnings that that go with that. Um, I think you'll find some practical advice, you'll find some technical advice, and uh, with Paul's generosity, he's agreed to stay around and chat after the, the formal presentations. But uh, I'm really excited about the material that he has assembled for you today. Um, Paul is a, a popular uh, instructor across the country on all matters uh, of dams. Uh, it's been my pleasure and honor to work with him on a number of sessions uh, put forward by the uh, Association of State Dam Safety Officials and um, his, his knowledge and his presentation skills are second to none. So uh, really, really feel good uh, that he's, he's willing to work with us and to uh, help uh, educate and improve the state of affairs out there for NRCS assisted upstream flood control structures. Um, some of the things we're gonna hit today are uh, some basics and uh, some of those tie back to engineering principles that um, you may recognize as you, as you go through the session today uh, that they tie to actual physical O&M activities that you perform on the dams that you maintain. Um, We'll look at where to find information about your project. And uh, a key question that we get many, many times is, uh, when do I need a professional engineer? Uh, inspections vary across the country and uh, uh, they vary by state in terms of requirement. Uh, there is some consistency probably to the NRCS involvement in uh, what level of inspections are needed. But the question is recurring. When do I need a professional engineer? And uh, some of Paul's material will speak to that this morning. And, uh, right back I, to you, sir. Thanks, Dan. Let me encourage you to grab a piece of paper or another computer or something, something to write with because uh, so much is gonna be presented today. That you're gonna to want to follow up on. You're gonna to want to pursue uh, perhaps as a recommendation for some of the work that you're doing. You're gonna have examples as uh, Dan had noted. And then let me just uh, one more time, encourage you to use the questions and answers system. That's different than the chat, park the chat, use the questions and answer system in their dashboard, and you'll see the questions coming up on your machine. If you go and, and tap on that icon right now, you'll see the questions coming up and you can enter an answer uh, also as we, as we go along today's session. Without further ado then, Paul Schweiger is with us today and we're gonna switch the screen over to him. You should have received Paul's bio there. If you're a speed reader, you can talk about that. You, we can talk about Paul's background. And Dan, maybe you wanna uh, make a point or two of some of Paul's background, our speaker today. Well, uh, as I said earlier, uh, Paul is a popular presenter in uh, the world of engineering and dam, dams, dam safety. Uh, you can see from his bio that he's quite experienced. He has uh, firsthand, uh, firsthand on the ground experience with NRCS assisted structures. Uh, and as I said earlier, he is, uh, he's one of several 
uh, premier instructors that provide uh, educational assistance to the Association of State Dam Safety Officials. So uh, we're excited to have you today, Paul, and we look forward to the uh, seeing the material you've put together. I know you invested considerable time in uh, maybe making this the best the best webinar ever. So thank you. Good. <clears throat> and uh, am I sharing the right screen? Do you, do you see my first slide? Coming through fine, Paul, and the voice is good too. Oh, perfect. Well, let's get started. And uh, thank you, Dr. Siebert, for that introduction. Um, you know, I've been working with Dr. Siebert, uh, doing training seminars all over the United States for about the past 15 years. And when he called me about this topic, he said, Paul, um, you know, we, we have this incredible, these incredible resources, and they've benefited our generation and previous generations tremendously, but they're going to benefit future generations even more. And it's absolutely critical that we take care of this infrastructure. And he came up with this title, Taking Care of the Investment Operation and Maintenance of USDA NRCS Assisted Flood Control Projects. And, and I love uh, that title. Uh, he also came up with the outline for a presentation and coached me on what kind of resources he believes are most important. And we're gonna start off the first part of the session, what every sponsor should know about their dam and also about the National Watershed Program itself. Then we're going to focus on how can NRCS dams fail? You know, the NRCS started building dams uh, with a vengeance starting in about 1948, uh, right up till today. And the dams that were built early on don't always look like the ones that are being built today. They don't have the same defensive measures. So we're gonna look at the, the historical perspective of how these dams have changed over time and what the current design standards are. We'll take a break, and then after the break, we're gonna come back and look at common inspection and assessment findings, not just inspecting the dams, but now that, that they're reaching the milestone where the majority of them are over 50 years old, uh, we're beginning to look at the original design and assess the dams. And I'm gonna share with you what in, in general, what kinds of things are we finding about these projects? And then a topic that is often overlooked, I think it's probably the most neglected part of NRCS dams is the earth cut auxiliary spillways. You know, you know they're designed to be um, operated so infrequently. I think that some dam owners and sponsors, because of that, they, they never see them passing water that sometimes they almost um, are don't realize that they're an uh, essential part and a critical part of the dam. So we're gonna, uh, focus, that's kind of a feature, I think, of this webinar. We're gonna look at earth cut auxiliary spillways and then wrap it up with when and how to engage a professional engineer. <clears throat> so let's start with what every sponsor should know about their dam. And if you don't have this resource, you need to have it in your library. And uh, Ray, and Dan, I think we put this as a resource as part of this webinar. There's a link to it uh, that you can download. Uh, it's titled USDA Watershed Programs, Facts and Figures. And the author of this is uh, somebody that I think pretty much everybody on this webinar knows, Larry Caldwell. You know, he is a giant when it comes to the NRCS Watershed Program. Uh, he has 54 years of professional experience. Not many people can say that. And his passion for the NRCS and the DAMS program really comes through in this document. Um, it's a snapshot in time. It, 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 if you wanna know about the program, I, I guarantee you the information you're looking for is in this uh, 300 page document. And uh, I've gone through it and I've, I've scattered probably about 50 different interesting facts about the program that I think you're gonna be interested in knowing throughout this webinar. Let's start with one of them here. This shows the number of dams constructed uh, by the NRCS and the years that they were constructed. So if you add them all up, there's about 1,270 
NRCS watershed projects with dams. Out of those, there are 11,841 flood control dams. You know, they're not flood prevention dams, they're flood control dams. We can't stop the weather, but we can control the outcome. <clears throat> if you look at this, starting in about 1958, an average of one dam was built every day for two decades. That's incredible. As of 1958, one dam was built every day for two decades. There's no other federal agency uh, that has built more dams than the NRCS. If you look at the Corps of Engineers, it's about 670. If you look at the Bureau of Reclamation, it's just under about 3,000. Now those are big dams, but nobody has built more dams than the NRCS. The other interesting thing that this graph shows is that uh, all of the dams that are highlighted in this gray are now over 50 years old. And when they were originally designed, uh, they were designed with an assumed design life of about 50 years. That doesn't mean that at year 51 um, that they're obsolete, but it does point to the fact that now it's time to take a good look. They, that, they were designed to perform well for a period of 50 years, and now to guarantee that they continue to work well, uh, operation, maintenance, and in some cases, rehabilitation, uh, it becomes very critical. If you want to know where these watersheds are, the, this, this kind of shows you the, the dams were really built um, under four authorizations, the PL 534, the PL 566, the pilot project, and the resource conservation and development project. And you can see where they're scattered throughout the states. So that shows you where the um, 11,841 dams are, and they're scattered throughout 47 states. The only states that don't have NRCS dams are Rhode Island, Delaware, and Alaska. Uh, but this plot shows you where the number of watershed dams by state. So we see that Texas, Oklahoma, and Iowa, uh, the, those states that are in dark red, have the greatest number, over uh, 1,200 dams in those states. Now, if you look at the hazard classification, the colors start to change quite a bit. Now we pick up uh, Kansas, West Virginia, and Georgia. And they have, they're among Texas and Oklahoma as far as the greatest number of high hazard dams. And if you're new to dams, uh, what does high hazard mean? It has nothing to do with the condition of the dam, but it has everything to do with the consequences if the dam were to fail and there was an uncontrolled release of the stored water. For high hazard dams, it means there's a population downstream and there's the potential for loss of life. So those dams are designed to a higher standard than say a low hazard or a significant hazard. Where the low hazard dam fails, it's pretty much limited to the loss of the resource, but if a significant dam, uh, hazard dam fails, uh, then it can start causing damage downstream, but no loss of life. So those high hazard dams are really important. Now the NRCS originally had 978 high hazard dams in the, their inventory. They, they were designed knowing that they were high hazard dams and they were designed to higher standards because they were high hazard dams. But something has happened since all of these dams were built. They now have 2,233 high hazard dams, and most of that is due to hazard creep. So it's important to understand what that is. What is hazard creep? Well, that refers to a dam that was originally built and operated as a lower significant hazard dam that's now reclassified as a high hazard dam. Why? Because of downstream development. And such dams often do not meet design and maintenance requirements for high hazard dams, and they have to be either improved or decommissioned. In most cases, they're improved. And the, the most important feature probably, uh, or, or design criteria for a, a high hazard dam is the amount of water that it needs to pass or, or the, the flood. And for high hazard dams, in most cases, it's the probable maximum precipitation 
that results in the probable maximum flood. Here's a good example of hazard creep. This is Dam Berkeley Dam, it's an NRCS dam designed in Georgia, and uh, it was built in the 1960s. And all the way up to 1993, I, I went into Google Earth and just took uh, an aerial image looking straight down. So here we have the dam. And then immediately downstream of the dam, we have some agriculture. And then it flows directly into the Chattahoochee River. So there's not a big consequence area between the dam and the next biggest drainage where that pretty much would absorb uh, any uncontrolled release from that dam if it were to fail. But then if you, and, and then this would be what we, we consider the consequence area. So that if the dam were to fail, uh, the area shaded in blue here would be where that flood wave could affect that property. And as you can see here, there's really no development. There's no uh, people at risk. And then in 2005, something happens. There's a, that somebody decides to build a house immediately downstream of the dam and that immediately changes it from a low or significant hazard dam to a high hazard dam. And that was 2005. If you fast forward to today, uh, now there's a lot more development, a lot more consequences. So that's why those almost 1,000 dams that were originally designed as high hazard dams in the inventory has grown to over 2,000 dams. And uh, I've got some more statistics on that I'm going to share in just a minute. Here's another one of my favorite studies. This is a New Creek Site 1 in West Virginia. It was built in 1957 to protect the uh, agricultural um, land downstream of the dam. And then fast forward now to today, and all that agricultural land has been replaced with urban development. And there, that is the location right there on the left side of the embankment where the auxiliary spillway is. And I'd like you to think about if that ever gets activated, where is the flow going to go? Not only that, the development is now right up against the embankment. And in some cases, here's the outlet conduit for that dam. And the, you can see that the uh, development is even affecting uh, the outlet works there. So I was had the pleasure of being out there earlier this spring. We're standing on the crest. We started looking over at the auxiliary spillway. We're looking straight down. You can see the outlet works at the toe and then just panning over uh, to the right. So this is uh, a challenge. And uh, just stopping here, here you can see again the outlet works. There's a swimming pool right next door. There are sheds right up to the toe of the dam. You can see the instrumentation for the dam. And there's absolutely no question that if you look downstream, you can see what the consequences are. This is a high hazard dam. And then as we looked over to the left, you know, where is that flow going to go from the auxiliary spillway? So a challenge. And uh, as, as I mentioned there, this hazard creep is happening all over the United States. And here's a quote that was taken from Larry Caldwell's report. He said, the number of dams being reclassified to high hazard is increasing each year. In the past 13 years, between 2006 and 2019, 493 NRCS dams were reclassified to high hazard in 30 states. So it's not just happening in one or two states, it's happening all over the place. That is an average of 38 NRCS dams each year that have been reclassified to high hazard. So that's the current rate of uh, th this happening. I was working with Karen Goff, who was the head of dam safety for uh, the North Dakota Dam Safety Program. And she said, uh, you know, I have an assignment for you. I need you to, we've got about 150 dams that we need to classify. So we did dam break analyses on all of these dams and developed two inundation zones. The red inundation zone would be a sunny day failure. And then the light green would be failure during a flood event. And then we took all of these shape files developed by uh, doing dam break analyses. And then we exported them into Google Earth as the final deliverable. So that from this point on, uh, we would use this to monitor what's going on downstream and to do an initial assessment. Are these dams, you know, low significant or high hazard dams? And then we, we sent this to uh, Karen, along with our assessment. 
And for this particular dam, this was the inundation area, and we said, this is a low hazard dam. And then we got a call about six months later and said, Paul, we think we made a mistake. There's about three of the 150 dams that appeared to be misclassified. You had them down as low hazard dams, and we think they're high hazard dams. And I said, boy, that, uh, there must be something wrong with our quality control. Let me take a look at it. And what had happened is between the time that we did this, uh, Google Earth had republished, like they always do, they constantly update their aerial imagery. And that's what she was looking at. And so we were looking at 2014. She was looking at 2015. And so that's just another example of hazard. So let's look at the uh, inventory of dams. And let's start by type. We're going to spend time talking about the things that matter most to you. So we better spend the time focused on the kind of dams that are most common. And if you look at the United States, about 91% of the dams are earth embankment dams like the one you see here. If you look at the NRCS inventory, I don't have the total number, but I believe it's more like 98%. Almost all of the dams are earth embankment dams. And this is a classic layout for an NRCS type dam. Uh, you can see the main earth embankment dam, and we're going to go through and talk about all these features of the principal spillway, the auxiliary spillway, uh, an impact basin, and but that's that's what I consider a classic a layout for an NRCS dam. Now, going back to Larry Caldwell's report, he provides a lot of statistics, and I thought these were some interesting ones. The median NRCS dam, like this, like this kind of a layout has an uh, uh, average height of about 32 feet. In other words, 50% of the dams in, in the inventory have heights less than 32 feet, and the other 50% have heights greater than 32 feet. The average dam length, so the crest of the dam, is about 850 feet. The median drainage area is 1.4 square miles. The median conduit diameter and that's the conduit from the principal spillway to the impact basin is two feet. About 19% of these dams have corrugated metal pipes as their principal spillway conduit. The average width of the auxiliary spillway is about 68 feet and the average age or the median age is about 54 years. A few more interesting statistics, the tallest dam, the highest in our CS dam, is 145 feet, and that's Lower North River Dam in Virginia. The one with the greatest drainage area is in Texas. That's running water number three at 252 square miles. And if you look at the investment in uh, you know, scale to 2020 uh, year, the total investment in all of the dams is about $24 billion. And if you look at the average annual benefits, uh, they, they exceed 10% per year. It's an average of $2.4 billion per year. Now that number is growing. If you go back in time, uh, the initial return was much less, but it is increasing. And especially as there's more and more development downstream, the flood control benefits uh, escalate. And so, so these, these uh, important critical infrastructure is just becoming more and more important. And it just emphasizes the need that we really need to uh, be on top of it and maintain it for the next generation. The number of people that are directly benefited is about 48 million, um, but every citizen in the United States benefits uh, from this program. And the number of farms that are benefited is about is over 180,000 farms. And one statistic that, that I'm, uh, that you should be proud of is the number of fatalities from failure of NRCS dams to this date remains at zero. There has been no loss of life and we wanna keep it that way. And that's another reason to uh, maintain the investment. There's so, a, a Paul, uh, if I yeah. might, uh, this is Ray. And uh, we had a question related to that last comment, in fact, 
Is there no oversight in the uh, to prevent construction in the breach zones of these dams? So with that kind of track record you just mentioned, I thought mm -hmm. I would get you in and ask that question on behalf of Pamela. Oh, that uh, Ray, that's a pretty complicated question, mm -hmm. and you know we just looked at two examples of hazard creep. The NRCS when they built the dams, in most cases they owned the footprint of the dam, the, that land, the reservoir area, but it wasn't practical to buy all the land downstream, right? That just doesn't make sense. That's owned by other people. Mm -hmm. And so it, there's a lot of uh, uh, coordination and, and it's very difficult to control that development. So, so the answer is um, in some cases there is, it depends upon the state, uh, but in most cases I would say there has not been a lot of coordination. Thanks, Paul. Now, there's a positive side of this too. You know, sometimes we focus on the negative. Uh, what if the dam fails? Has there been any fatalities? The, uh, the, these are flood control dams. Initially, the focus was on, I think, the economics and protecting the land from flooding and protecting farmers uh, so that they would be successful in what they're doing. And as more and more of these dams transition uh, from agricultural to urbanized areas, their benefits are changing. And we'll never know how many lives these dams have saved. You know, we were looking at the annual average benefits of 2.4 billion. Um, I wonder if those dams had never been built and the areas downstream of the dams had not been controlled, the floods had not been controlled, um, what would be the loss of life? And we'll never know, but I know, I know for certainty that these dams are also saving lives just by, by looking at the benefits. Now, if you take a, a section through the dam, it's, it's kind of important to see how they work. And at the very bottom, it, we generally have something we refer to as dead storage. Sometimes we call it as sediment storage, but that's a misnomer because the sediment really doesn't find its way to the very bottom of the reservoir. Now we do allocate sediment storage within the reservoir, but it's distributed everywhere uh, from you know, the top of the dam all the way down, not just at the very bottom. And then we have from that uh, dead storage up to the crest of the riser structure, in most cases, the, the principal spillway, um, a, a permanent pool or what's often referred to as a normal pool. Not all of the NRCS dams have this, a lot of them are dry dams, but there could be a lot of reasons. And, and the number one reason that I've seen is recreation. They're small pools, they're, they're used by the community for fishing, uh, for passive recreation and things like that. But then the major benefit, the big benefit is flood storage. So the principal spillway that maintains this normal pool as you see in the picture in the offset here, but then during a flood, there is additional storage. And that's where most of the storage is on these projects. And what that does is it attenuates floods, normally up to the 100-year flood. That's the most common. And so that what it's doing is when you have a flood, um, you know, from a one-year flood up to a 100-year flood, it really knocks the intensity of the flood that's coming into that reservoir, and it stores it, and it and it releases it more gradually so that the people and the resources that are downstream are protected by the control of that inflow hydrograph. But then you get to a certain point where you can't store that water, it's just too much. And that's where the auxiliary spillway takes over. It used to be called the emergency spillway. We stopped doing that because uh, it was the media that was saying, oh, is the emergency spillway is flowing, there must be an emergency. When there was no emergency, everything was performing as designed. So the trend is now to call it the auxiliary spillway. And that's a super important feature because without that, uh, the reservoir would continue to rise and the dam would be overtopped. And when an earth embankment is overtopped, uh, that is very undesirable. That's considered a failure. There's just not, there's, we, we know that in most cases, when an earth embankment dam is overtopped, it's prone to erosion and breaching. So as a reminder, and this is a statement that um, is made in Larry Caldwell, it's one of his quotes. 
And he says NRCS dams provide flood control, not flood prevention. We can't stop the floods, but we can control them. Now, before I, I focus on earth embankment dams, which is what we're going to do next, I did want to point out that the NRCS in their portfolio of dams has other kinds of dams as well. Here's a nice big concrete gravity dam, Spring Canyon Dam in New Mexico. Uh, here's Devil's Kitchen Dam in Illinois, designed by the NRCS. Elkwater Fork Dam, a modern roller compacted concrete dam uh, built uh, in West Virginia. And this one's both water supply and some flood control. Hughes River Dam in West Virginia, another big flood control dam. Big recreation, it's in the middle of a park and it also provides some water supply as well. So many of these dams uh, serve many purposes. Now let's focus on the classic layout and the different features and uh, get familiar with some of the early designs, the new designs and some of the, the critical issues. Well, the principal spillway, often sometimes referred to as a riser structure, that maintains the normal pool. And whenever it rains, the water comes in and it, it will pass through that structure. And if you, if you look at it when the reservoir is down, most of the time you, don't, you only see the top part here. But if you look at it without the water, uh, this is what a classic riser, modern riser structure would look like. It can have different gates to uh, control the reservoir level if you want it for maintenance or something like that. Uh, you know, starting at the top, you, the, the, the superstructure here at the top, the bonnet, is really a, a very uh, highly refined trash rack and anti-vortex device so that the water can very efficiently enter, drop down the, the riser structure, and then pass through the dam through the principal spillway outlet. In some cases, they attach some uh, pertinences to the tower. This one has a perforated pipe that acts as a water supply uh, intake, and maybe most importantly, the low level drain gate so that there is a way to empty the reservoir for maintenance or during an emergency. But most of the time we just see the top part. And if you do a cutaway of that structure, and we're gonna look at a couple of other uh, three-dimensional views, you can see uh, this one here has the, um, and it, the divider wall, it has the inlet weir, and it has the trash racks, the controlled debris. So in most cases, you'll see something like this. So here's the normal pool. It's right at the level of the inlet weir. And then during floods, this, this is actually completely underwater and the condo would be flowing full. Here's an example of one that was recently replaced in West Virginia. And the reason it was replaced was that this dam was rehabilitated. And not only was it rehabilitated, but some of the flood control storage was reallocated for water supply because that was the greater benefit and need for this project. So that's why you see a re the relic of the old one, but you can also see the new riser structure that was, being, was constructed immediately upstream of the older one. And you can see some of the cutaways here. This, this middle view clearly shows that weir structure. Something else that you see here that's a little bit different then what we've seen so far is you look at the very top, um, the more modern riser structures now are being equipped with handrails and uh, fall protection and things like that. And we're seeing more and more of these uh, riser structures being modified just to improve the safety for the people that have to operate them. Now, I did wanna look, show you, um, that is the classic riser structure but there are many, many variations out there, but they're all essentially doing the same thing. And I think this was during the early years, there's a lot of experimentation on, you know, what is the ideal configuration for a riser structure? So here's one at Warm Springs, West Virginia. Here's a, a different one. And just want you to be aware that if you see different riser structures, uh, they're all doing the same thing, but they were all uh, you know, trying different designs. Some of them are built within the embankment, the upstream slope of the embankment. Uh, some are within the reservoir and some are variations, obviously. This is the mother of all riser structures that I've ever seen. I, I think it's the biggest one that the NRCS has ever built. Uh, the conduit that is uh, connected to this riser structure is eight foot feet in diameter. And this was 
Tyler Dam in Massachusetts. I think it's so big that if they wanted to, they could put a tennis court on the top of it. And, but that's the biggest, right down to probably the smallest. This one is an 18 inch diameter corrugated metal pipe and it has a trash rack and the anti-vortex. So, so it has all the, the, the same um, kind of features, but very small. So from, from big to small. And this is the tallest one that I'm aware of. Uh, this is an, it's, it's a little over 80 feet high. It's at New Creek Site 14 in West Virginia. And you can see the picture here on the right is looking down the shaft. So if you were to open up the manhole and look down, um, you would see that 80 foot drop to the bottom. And here's one that is, is not as, as um, modern or it doesn't have that, that you know, elaborate trash rack on the top, but what it does show you, we can see how it works. So after a rain event, the reservoir level comes up and you can see the walls in the side act as weirs and the water just plunges from here down to the bottom. So from the principal spillway, you can see the dashed line. Where does water go? It goes down the riser structure and then it flows through the principal spillway conduit to an outlet. And, the, and just like uh, the NRCS has perfected the riser structure, and has standardized that design, they've done the same thing with the impact basin. And that is probably the most uh, well-engineered and perfected energy dissipation device for this type of spillway. A cut through there, you can see here's the outlet pipe. Uh, it, it shoots at um, you know full reservoir head and it, it hits the baffle wall and then that the purpose of this structure is to force the hydraulic jump within this structure and dissipate the energy so that when the flow is released into the stream downstream, it doesn't erode the channel or damage the embankment. This, this is at Upper Decker Site 1. And if you went to the top of the dam and looked in the reservoir, you would not see the top of the riser structure. That's because this is during a flood event. So this flood control project is doing its job. It's storing that flood flow in the reservoir and it's releasing it, but the conduit is flowing at maximum capacity here. And this is, if you, if you look straight in, you can see the energy being dissipated at this impact basin. So it's highly turbulent there. And then it, it, you know, the hydraulic jump is forced within the concrete structure. And then the flow is released downstream, very efficient, very effective energy dissipation structure. Now, in some cases, you may be fortunate to have bedrock fairly shallow at the outlet and you can design a nice plunge pool. And uh, there, that, that is also, it's more economical. And instead of connecting the pipe to an impact basin, uh, you can design a plunge pool like what you see here. And then we have the auxiliary spillway. And that is um, the classic design for an auxiliary spillway is to have an earth cut or even better, a rock cut. So if you have bedrock over at the left or right abutment, um, that would be ideal because the more erosion resistant the material is, the better performing the spillway is. The, the classic design is to have a 2% grade approaching a 30 foot level crest section. And we kind of boxed out what that level crest section looks like there. And the approach can be coming in at uh, a curved section because the flow from the reservoir up to the control section, the velocities are relatively low. They're, it's subcritical flow. But once the flow passes over the control section, it goes from subcritical, passes through critical depth, and it continues to accelerate. And from that point going downstream, it's flowing supercritical. And once you get the, the water accelerated like that, you don't want to, um, turn it one way or the other, because that can accelerate the flow concentration and erosion. And so the, the classic design is to have about a 2% grade from the control section downstream until it passes the toe of the embankment. So you can see that dashed line that represents where the toe is, but at some point you have to turn the flow back into the natural stream. And that's what's going on here. You can see then the exit channel starts to, to bend and it goes back to the natural channel.
Now, these auxiliary spillways, in most cases, as I mentioned, the crest is set so that it does not get activated until you get a flood in excess of the 100 year flood. So it has about a 1% chance any year of being activated. Now, some of these auxiliary spillways, uh, if the ideal location obviously is at the left or right abutment of the dam, and to put it as far away from the dam as you can. So if you can create a buffer zone between the spillway and the embankment, that would be ideal. But in some places like West Virginia and Virginia, where the, the valleys are so steep, uh, you'd end up removing the hillside on the left or right side. There's no room to, to move the spillway that far over. So now we start seeing things like this, where right up against the embankment at the, at the left, in this case on the right groin, uh, we'll have a spillway training dike. And so that becomes a very important structure uh, because without that, the flow would go down the groin of the, of the dam and that, that would not be good. So that's another feature. So here we're in Tennessee and this is uh, a classic layout for a earth cut grass line spillway. In this case, this is not a rock cut. If you were to uh, do subsurface exploration below this, here's a, the control section that's lined up with the dam. And then we're looking downstream, but this is all sandy type material. And the grass lining on these spillways is the primary erosion protection. And that means it has to be maintained. And you can see in this example, they're doing a great job maintaining it. And here we are at that same spillway and now this is probably somewhere between a 100 and 500 year flood. And it's doing the job it was designed to do. And just looking at it from different angles, it's safely passing that flow uh, through the spillway, around the dam, to the tow and beyond. So that, that's a, a good example. Now, some of these spillways are so wide uh, that when they get more than about 200 feet wide across the crest, that there's the option to put in splitter dikes. And that's what you see here. So if you have an NRCS uh, spillway that's really wide and you have these splitter dikes, uh, the reason why is they want to prevent the flow from concentrating too much on one side or the other side, and to try to keep the flow fairly uniform and flowing in the same direction throughout the spillway. Now, this one here obviously has some erosion damage, and we're gonna be talking about that at the end of this uh, webinar. That's gonna be a feature presentation. But just like the NRCS uh, has mainly earth cut grass line spillways, they also have other types of spillways. And I just wanted to point that out. Here's a really big concrete uh, structural spillway at Tyler Dam. And well, you can Paul, see that. Uh, if I can break yeah. in here too, uh, one of the questions we had come in was, is Tyler Dam the official a name for that particular dam that you're showing right now. Uh, the individual said they were trying to find it on uh, Geo Observer, but could not find it uh, using that name. So you're right there on top of that. Uh, so hate to break in, but uh, yeah, that's the name. Uh, I've always um, yeah, yeah. You know, I know a lot of NRCS dams are dam number seven, dam number eleven, and things right. like that. And right. sometimes these dams get um, a local name. You know, they get named after somebody after a while or uh -huh. because of a location. But uh, I'll tell you what, I'll look into that. Okay. And if, if they want to know where it is, because uh, you can go to Google Earth, it's really interesting. This one's very, has some really interesting features. It's got a highway going, splitting the dam in half. Uh, that's not shown in here, but it's a really interesting project. It also has a very large drainage area. I think this drainage area on this one I, if I remember right, I think it's about 60 square miles. So it, it's a big drainage area. But this this is a drop structure with a very elaborate uh, buttress on the downstream side. That's in Massachusetts. This is one in Pennsylvania, a similar structure, just a, a little bit different layout. I just wanted to point it out that the NRCS has a lot of cool spillways and, and other types of dams and not just the classic one that we looked at. And they're changing with time. We're, we're seeing a lot of modifications um, because, it, and we're gonna talk about why is this happening? You know, it, some of it's because of hazard creep where uh, you have a, a dam like this one that was originally designed as low or significant and now it's high hazard 
and it doesn't pass the design flood. And the auxiliary spillway doesn't have the capacity. The other issue is that sometimes the auxiliary spillway just, um, it, it has erosion problems. In this case, this is an, the downstream slope of the embankment dam was completely armored with roller compacted concrete. You can see the before picture in the upper part. And to pass the additional discharge associated with the problem maximum flood, and also to make sure that uh, you know the address the problems with the auxiliary spillway erosion, the downstream slope of the embankment was uh, reinforced or or armored with roller compacted concrete, and this is the step faced and stilling basin. So you're going to see more and more of these things. Here's one. That last one was in West Virginia. This one is Umbarger, Texas. Again, the entire embankment on this one was armored with roller compacted concrete so that it could be over top. Sometimes it's not the entire embankment. You know, some of these embankments are really long. And you don't need uh, to do that. And it's not cost effective. So here's Renwick Dam. And in this one, they did the same thing with roller compacted concrete, uh, but they used conventional concrete training walls and they armored only a partial section of the embankment for the same reason. And some of these auxiliary spillways, uh, you know, all they need is a little bit of help. Um, you know, they have enough capacity, but there are issues associated with erosion if they ever get activated, or sometimes they were activated and they did erode. And here's New Creek Site 14. So it's about a, an 80 foot drop from the crest of the spillway down to the bottom. And that's a lot of energy. And in this case, the depth of flow that would go over the crest of this spillway during the problem maximum flood is 13 feet. So that, that's a lot of flow. Now, this is an example of one in, in Virginia that was modified after it was activated, because you can see what happened to it. If it wasn't for the bedrock outcrop that was uh, below the, the grass line spillway, uh, it would have completely breached. As it was, it breached a little bit. You can see the original spillway crest and the bedrock was below it. So they were kind of very fortunate that it didn't completely breach through. But the, the solution afterwards was to go in and build a structural spillway and replace the auxiliary spillway with a structural spillway. Um, other things that are we're seeing now with a lot of the NRCS uh, earth cut grass line spillways is the realizing that that grass lining isn't always adequate for the design flood. So they're reinforcing the spillway or, or protecting it with articulated concrete blocks, which is another um, way of, of doing that. And in this case, this is the same spillway. Uh, after they armor it with the blocks, they topsoil and seed it. And then you don't even, it looks just like the, the previous spillway as far as operation and maintenance goes, but they know that if it ever does get activated and there is erosion of the grass lining, um, that the backup is the articulated concrete blocks. And in some cases they don't uh, cover them afterwards with topsoil and seeded. And this is one where Erica Althoff uh, from the North Dakota NRCS sent me these cool videos. She said, we had one spillway um, at Absaraka Dam in North Dakota that was damaged when it was activated. And uh, that was a video that she said three years in a row, it was activated and for a duration of seven days. That was an example of where they armored the uh, spillway with articulated concrete blocks. So it's really great to have some of these new technologies that we could use to help rehabilitate and upgrade these, these uh, spillways. Now let's focus on the dam, the embankment. I mean, that is, um, the NRCS has a lot of infrastructure, but the dams are the only infrastructure that have the potential to do harm if they fail. So the embankment is holding back water. Now, most of the time, it's just a shallow normal pool, but during a flood event, the water can go right up to the crest of the embankment. So it's important that the embankment perform. And you can think of it, every time there's a flood, it's almost like there's a first filling or that it's seeing that load almost for the first time. Now, the when you look at when these dams were built, this is a plot of the red, the red bar lines are earth embankment dams built throughout the United States, not just by the NRCS, but by everyone. And then the blue are concrete dams. And it, you can see that early on, there was a higher proportion of concrete dams than there were earth embankment dams. You know, why is that? And why all of a sudden do we have this peak 
starting after World War II. A lot of that had to do with uh, what did we have to work with? You know, building an embankment dam means you're going to excavate, move, and compact a tremendous amount of fill material. And if you're working with this kind of equipment, that is a very difficult process, very labor intensive, you know, doing all that compaction. And, and we've been, been learning, I thought it was interesting, uh, Dr. David Rogers did some research and, and the first compaction equipment really did replicate uh, what we knew when animals would, uh, you know, we'd run them over the fill zone, they would compact the soil. So the original sheep's foot roller looked just like that. I thought that was kind of interesting. But early on, these embankment dams were super labor intensive and it was actually more economical to build a masonry dam or a concrete dam until after World War II. And that's really when the NRCS or the SCS at that time dam building program took off. And that's because of the kind of equipment we had. We have now these big bulldozers, these scrapers, uh, compactors and hauling uh, vehicles. So now we're able to go to the site, you know, we have the borrow material there in the reservoir and we can move the earth around a lot more efficiently. A little bit of the history, we, we've learned a lot and the NRCS pioneered embankment dam design probably more than anybody else. But the first dams were fairly simple and it's important to understand, you know, what, what is the foundation of the dam? Well, if, if you go out pretty much anywhere in the United States uh, and you remove the vegetation from the surface, that first layer is called overburden. And that's weathered bedrock. Sometimes it's alluvial material that was deposited by the stream. And it's, it's often uh, not, it's inconsistent, it's layered, it's sediment layers and things like that. And then you get to the, down to the bedrock. So if you build a dam, and you go to the reservoir and you just take fill and you build a dam out of that fill, that's referred to as a homogeneous dam. So all that material is the same. And then if you were to build, uh, fill that up, you would have what is called a phreatic surface developed through the embankment. And that, that surface is really a boundary. Above that, the embankment is moist or dry, Below that, the embankment is uh, fully saturated. And so if you were to put a piezometer or an observation well in there, you'd see that this line would be well-defined. And it's really important to understand this. And that would mean if, if this was your phreatic surface and you were inspecting the downstream slope of the dam, you'd expect everything up to that line to be wet. In fact, you'd be expecting seepage uh, to be weeping out or flowing out of the dam at that location. And because these are flood control dams, uh, most of the time that normal pool is quite low and then it goes up fairly quickly during a flood. And so this, there, there's a lot that's going on within the embankment during a flood. So you can have seepage through the embankment. You can also have seepage through the overburden layer and you can have seepage through the bedrock. Now, this is a, a video that of, of a, a professor kind of illustrating a homogeneous earth embankment dam. It's a good example of a flood control dam because he's filling it up for the, for the first time. And you can see the darker zone here, that's referred to as the wetting front. So as the embankment gets saturated, uh, the water will, will begin flowing through it and you can see the progression of that wetting front. And if I fast forward this, now the wetting front, it's almost just like what we showed uh, the downstream slope is wet and look how that affects the structural integrity of the embankment. You can see it spreading out and it changes the strength properties of the soil or the slope stability. And we, we end up with a failure. Well, you know, we, we learned from that. And th this is an example of uh, not a lab, but this is a real dam. It's not being overtopped. Uh, the downstream slope was being saturated and it failed. And I, th I think you, everybody saw this when it happened um, in Michigan in 2020, the Edenfield Dam failure. And then that, so after that happened, it resulted in the uncontrolled release of flow from the reservoir. So we don't want that to happen. So engineers uh, understood, you know, we've got these three flow paths. Uh, what do we do about it? Um, they said, well, let's build a internal drainage system. So some the, the next step in the evolution of, of 
dam building was to put in a blanket drain. So you may have a, a homogeneous embankment dam, especially if it's a lower significant hazard dam. Um, a lot of those are homogeneous embankment dams. But by putting in a blanket drain, and if it's properly designed and filtered so that any seepage that uh, goes through the embankment, it's going to follow the path of least resistance. And it's gonna, going to um, want to go into this blanket drain. It will be filtered, and then it will be safely discharged. So that solves a lot of problems. Now you see the downstream slope isn't saturated anymore. You're pulling down the phreatic surface. Now you are increasing the hydraulic gradient because the flow path is shorter. And, and that, that's a concern. But if you design the drainage system to be filtered, that's not so bad. So that, that's a, a major improvement. Now, that was kind of ideal, but this overburden material doesn't always, it's not always homogeneous and it's often not impervious. Sometimes at the very surface, you'll have a confining layer, a finer soil type material, let, let's say a clay layer. And then below that, because it was deposited by the uh, river, you may have pockets or zones, horizontal zones, where there's sands or gravels. And that, that really presents a more complicated situation for this type of a dam, because you essentially have the, the greater seepage coming from the reservoir into that gravel sand zone. And then once it gets below the toe of the dam, there's a, a very significant hydraulic gradient that can develop at the toe of the dam. And that can manifest itself in a lot of different ways. Uh, one of them here, we have an instrument at the toe of the dam. It, it's an observation well, and what it's telling us is below that confining layer, the water pressure, if there was a hole, if you were to drill a hole through there, you'd have a geyser shooting up to where uh, this gentleman is pointing his finger. That's the water pressure below that zone. So what do you do in a case like that? Well, engineers, um, what would put in one solution is to put in relief wells. And that is to drill a series of wells at the toe of the dam. And that would intercept that high pressure seepage and then discharge it safely without it emerging at the top or at the toe. So if you have that situation at your dam, you might see something like this. So here at the toe of the dam, you can see all these wells that were installed at the toe of the dam for that very reason. And here is another example looking uh, in that direction. <clears throat> now, the other way to deal with that and this is more common, if you can, if this overburden is not too deep, you can just remove it and remove a trench of it here. And that's referred to as a cutoff trench. And now you solve that problem uh, by, by putting in some impervious fill there and breaking that sand or gravel zone and, and preventing that from that confining layer. And then um, to improve the performance of dams, engineers realize that there are different kinds of soils. Uh, we might have clay deposits in the watershed, and then we might have other zones that are more pervious. So we can have a shell material and we can have a core material and the core material can be more of a clay. That'll be our impervious zone. And then to keep that stable, we'll place shell material on the upstream downstream side, and we'll still have a toe drain uh, to make sure that we control the phreatic surface there. So now we're controlling the phreatic surface, not just with the drain, but with the impervious core as well. So if you were to go out and see one of these dams being built, you'll probably see different colors of fill where the coarser material is on the outside, the upstream and downstream side, and is placed concurrent with the clay material that's placed in the core here. And that was a big improvement on making these dams watertight, but it introduced a couple of problems as well. Now, the other issue is there's still one more seepage path that we haven't addressed, and that's the seepage through the bedrock. And mainly for water supply dams, where you really don't want to lose any water, uh, the next step would be to drill holes through the bedrock and then to grout all of the cracks and fractures so that you would tighten up the foundation and, and control seepage through the foundation. And about 1950, um, we had some engineers do a lot of studies on embankment dams in Casa Grande, Arthur, Arthur Casa Grande in 1950, um, really started looking at embankment dams. And his contribution to dam safety 
was to recognize that if I, if I was to state it very simply, we should assume that all dams crack, that there's a potential for all dams to crack and there's a whole bunch of reasons why that can occur. And the kind of cracking that we're gonna focus on now is transverse cracking in the upstream and the downstream direction. And the, the, there are different reasons why. It could be uh, because of differential settlement so that if you had a discontinuity in the foundation, so this zone up here, well, let's say it's uh, 30 feet high, it's got 30 feet to settle. And then if you step down suddenly, you might be at 50 feet here that will compress. So this will settle more than this. And that differential settlement will create stresses in the embankment and that can result in cracking. The other one, and it took me a while to understand this, but this is a big deal. We build, uh, penetrations through embankments. And let's say this foundation was on bedrock, and then we put in a nice big conduit here. Let's say it's a four foot diameter conduit. We encase it in a concrete cradle. Well, what happens? The settlement to the left and right of that cradle, there's a lot more compression of that fill material that can take, take place of the embankment. And then if you just go over to the top, uh, there's less. And that will create high stress concentrations right at the left and right immediately above that encased conduit. And that can propagate cracks through the embankment. And I think a lot of engineers didn't realize the potential for that to occur. The other one is if you're building the dam and the foundation material or the compressibility of the overburden material, uh, like you may have very little here and it's just bedrock. And then over here, you, you have uh, less, so you get a lot more compression here and that can uh, result in transverse cracking as well. So those are some of the reasons why. There are other reasons for transverse cracking. It could be drying of the embankment. Uh, it could be because of an unstable uh, collapsible soil within the overburden. Like some, some of the geotechnical engineers refer to it as a deck of cards. So if you could have an unstable soil and then when it gets saturated, uh, the, the, deck, the, the house of cards uh, will fall, collapse, and then you can get a settlement and that can cause cracking as well. But the NRCS um, has looked into this and this is a, a dam, an NRCS flood control dam in Arizona where they actually did uh, have cracks, transverse cracks. And I want to know, are they just on the surface or do they go deeper? And sure enough, uh, they went deeper. So the solution, the next step in the evolution was if we're going to build zone embankment dams, let's have an internal filter seepage collection system. So we're gonna take that blanket drain and we're gonna run it up the slope of the impervious fill. That way, if there's a crack or a defect or a concentrated seep or, or you know, for whatever reason, there's flow going through this, this sand chimney layer will intercept it and filter the seepage and prevent any loss of embankment material or internal erosion. It was a huge leap forward. And the NRCS is credited for developing the criteria for designing these filters to be compatible with the embankment material. The most common um, situation here, just to show how it works, uh, this is like a magnified zone of the, of the sand. And then this would be the very fine clay particles. Seepage is going through the embankment Let's say you get a transverse crack. Uh, it, the nice thing about these sand filters is they're self-healing. Uh, you can't propagate a crack through a sand filter unless it's not clean and there's some cementitious problems. That, that, but that's a special case. But most cases, if you design the sand filter correctly, uh, you cannot propagate a crack through it. So the crack will stop at the upstream face of the filter. The seepage, uh, if there is seepage and it's pulling previous fill material with it, it will form a filter cake until you get reach some equilibrium um, flow condition of head loss. And then it will, the, the, the seepage will then find its way into the filter and safely uh, you know, discharge. It'll be a filtered exit of the seepage. Uh, what does that look like? Here's a kind of a classic layout. You have a, a perforated pipe surrounded by uh, like a number eight stone or a pea gravel, which is then surrounded by the 
uh, C33 sand in most cases, but that has to be designed to be compatible. In most cases, that 333 sand is, is, is uh, the choice and it, it's a wash sand and that, that, that makes up the chimney drain and it's compatible with the gravel drain, which is compatible with the perforated pipe. And now you've got an ideal system so that any seepage that goes through, if there's a defect, a crack, I like what James uh, Talbot uh, would say. He said, I've never seen a, a dam that has had a filtered uh, seepage collection system built within the embankment fail because of internal erosion. He says it's never happened. So this is the modern defensive measure for that. Uh, just a lesson learned around the 70s, we started getting excited about geotextiles and thinking that they were the solution to replace all these expensive graded filters of sand and gravel. So we were taking the perforated pipe and just wrapping it with the geotextile. We now know that that is not good practice. Geotextiles used as filters in dams is highly discouraged. They can be used as separators, but not filters, because what we found would happen is they would be easily clogged. Um, sometimes the, there would be folds or, or you know, seams that would open up. And it's something as simple as biofouling, like a slime. And it just wouldn't act as a filter anymore over time. They just don't perform well over time. And that takes us to Fontenelle Dam in Wyoming, about 1963. So this dam was built with all of those modern embankment um, defensive measures that we just talked about. We went from a homogeneous embankment dam to a blanket drain to an impervious core with a blanket drain to an impervious core with a chimney drain and a blanket drain. We thought we had the problem solved. And then Fontenelle Dam. Fontenelle Dam had all of those features. Uh, yet we still didn't completely solve the problem of internal erosion. He said, well, Paul, I thought you said that James Talbot said that any dam with a modern filtered seepage collection system has not failed. Well, we did learn one more lesson from Fontenelle. So what was missing from this detail? Take a look at this. What did we miss? Um, aren't all of the seepage exits filtered? And the answer is no. We still have to filter the zone from the bedrock all the way up through the overburden because that is another seepage path and that needs to be filtered as well. And that's what happened at Fontenelle. That contact at the bedrock and the overbird material was not filtered. And that was the source where this unfiltered seepage could take particles from the embankment and uh, discharge them downstream. So now this, now we're looking at a, a fully modern design. Uh, the other thing that, that uh, happened after that was well, a lot of these embankments, um, the downstream slope wasn't fully stable, especially for seismic events. So a, a common fix was to add a berm to the downstream slope to make it more stable. And then we realized that on some of the bigger reservoirs, with a lot of wave action, uh, we need some additional protection to protect the upstream slope of the dam. So now we've got a zone dam with upstream slope protection and a berm, and this is pretty much a modern dam. So well, Paul, let me break in with One another of the question. Most serious dam. Yep. Related to uh, before we move to the video, uh, if you go back to that last slide, uh, if the chimney filter saturates with sediment, what can happen? How do you prevent that? All right, now these are fairly robust um, systems. And like that, that graph, I, I kind of showed back here real quick. Mm -hmm. These are designed, the, if, if this filter is designed according to NRCS procedures in their National Engineering Handbook, no fine material will infiltrate the, um, the, 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 the vertical filter or the chimney drain. And these, these are generally pretty thick. They're like three feet thick. Um, as, as shown here, the, the, it will stop at that interface and form this filter cake. So it will not completely fill this. And th th this covers the entire downstream slope of the embankment, you know, of, of the impervious core. So although you get a localized crack, this filter cake will then just cause the seepage to go down the crack 
around the filter cake and then flow into the, um, the filter system. And it, it, it will not become, it should last, you know, for the life of the project. Ray, Thanks, does that, Paul. is, is yeah. that good enough? Yeah, I think so. Uh, you know, it was about the chimney filter and drain and uh, would it become sediment that, and, and I think you got that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's what this is all about, to filter it. And, and if you do have local defects, it, it, it may plug it up a little bit there, but it will bypass it. And there's so much capacity built into these that that should be okay. Okay, thanks, Paul. One of the most serious dam safety concerns is the stability of the earthen embankment. Now, Ray, could I get an audio check? Can you hear that video? Yes, we're hearing it. Mm -hmm. All right. Unsafe conditions could lead to a major slide that threatens the safety of the dam. A key factor to stability is the location of the phreatic line, or the fully saturated zone of the soils within the embankment. In safe dams, this level is well confined below the surface. Since soils that are fully saturated are not as strong, a higher phreatic line can reduce the ability of the embankment to resist sliding. This is often noted by seepage exiting on the downstream face of the dam. Weak or poorly compacted soils can increase both seepage and the phreatic level, as well as weaken the embankment, contributing to a sliding failure of the dam. Properly designed dams often include an internal drainage system, such as a sand chimney and blanket drain. They serve as a filter to keep seepage from moving any soil, as well as allowing seepage to be removed in a controlled fashion. This lowers the phreatic line and improves the stability of the embankment. For existing dams with a high phreatic line, two alternatives can improve the dam's stability. One is to add a drain near the toe to both filter the seepage and lower the phreatic line through a controlled release of the seepage. The second is to add a berm for added resistance and improved stability of the embankment. This does not lower the phreatic line, but improves the dam stability by adding weight to prevent slides in the embankment. All right. So I, here is, if you were building a modern NRCS dam today or designing one, and it was designed to high hazard dam standards, it would look like this. And this is kind of a classic NRCS layout where you have the earth embankment, you have the riser structure, the auxiliary spillway, and I like this auxiliary spillway is configured so it discharges away from the embankment. And you know, that, that's, if you can do that, that is an ideal. And it's an earth cut uh, because of the steep slope on the left side, it looks like it's in rock and it's grass lined. And now we're uh, approaching the embankment and you'll notice that we have the left and right groin as if you're looking downstream. Here we have the groin, it's got some Rip wrap protection in it because that's that's an area of flow concentration. It's got that classic impact basin here, and you'll see these holes on the side. That's where the drainage system for the embankment comes through. You can monitor seepage through the dam. So we're going up the slope. Uh, we're just going to take a quick pass around the riser structure, and uh, we can kind of see through the water what that looks like. It's got the access ladder. It has a staff gauge. This one's equipped with a perforated pipe for uh, a water supply intake. It's got uh, a gate on the side, on the bottom here. And that looks like the operator for the water supply gate. And then we're gonna do a cutaway through the embankment. Here you can see the trash racks and the manholes that give you access inside for inspecting uh, the riser structure. And now we're gonna do a cutaway and you can see the overburden. And then the connected to the riser structure is the outlet conduit on a cradle. There's a plinth, this is, this is the bedrock foundation so that you can grow through that. You can see the clay core, the chimney drain, the blanket drain, and then the seepage collection system here with the pipe, the perforated pipe. And uh, then the foundation is grouted, consolidation grouting on the top, and then uh, normal grouting on uh, through the deeper part. So that's a pretty modern 
example of how an NRCS exam would be designed today. Now, not all of them will look exactly the same. Uh, a lot of it depends upon the depth of the overburden. In this case, they removed all the overburden and just placed it on the bedrock. So every 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 dam is like snowflakes. There's no two the same, and the geology is all, always different. Uh, this is what it might look like under construction. You can see the overburden, the foundation bedrock, the the slab anchored to the foundation so they can then drill through that. You can see them drilling holes here. Then they grout uh, those holes to, to seal up the foundation and then build the core, the, the, the chimney drain that goes through the overburden up through the core. And then um, we fill it up and that would be the phreatic surface and the conduit would then convey the flow safely downstream, the seepage. That's what it looks like later during construction. And then we have a, a finished product. Now here, what do you do with these older dams? Uh, here's New Creek Site 14 in West Virginia. And uh, something should pop out to you if you were inspecting this dam. It's nice and dry. And you can see the vegetation is kind of brown. And all of a sudden it gets lush green here. And then it gets brown again. So something's going on. And if you were to go to this dam at another time, here the uh, the maintenance staff that's mowing the downstream slope, he can't even mow this zone because it is so saturated and wet. Uh, so he's basically defining the seepage zone through this embankment. And oftentimes the reason why we have this is they may have stopped construction somewhere in here for the winter season. And then when they resume construction, they, they should have you know removed that top layer because it was loosened because of freeze thaw and weathering. Um, and and that, that's usually the, the, the main reason why we see stuff like this. Uh, but this dam uh, was more of a homogeneous embankment without you know, the modern filter system, very steep slope. So you can always put it in afterwards. So you strip the downstream slope and you start at the bottom. And here you can see the, the fine uh, drain material. And you're building like a burrito of the, it, that's encapsulating the, the number eight stone of the pea gravel. And then we put that perforated pipe in it. And then we bury that. And you can see how that burrito is coming along here. We've got the, the gravel, the sand, and then we're putting embankment fill on top of that. And it, it, in order to do that, you're flattening the slope. So you need to extend the conduit. In this case, we extended it about 60 feet. Um, it took advantage of when you get to the conduit, you build a filter diaphragm around the conduit because that's a critical area they want filtered. So they've got the sand. And then you're then off to the races and you take that um, sand layer and you build it on the upstream slope. You can see them removing the vegetation as they work their way up. And then they're placing the, the shell material concurrent with the, the, the chimney drain until they get, you can see them here building it up until they get to the top of the dam. And then they top that off and topsoil and seed it. And now you've taken an older dam that didn't have the, the modern defensive measures and you bring it up to current design standards. So that's another way of maintaining our infrastructure. And now let's take a, a quick uh, look at how can our NRCS dams fail. And I'm, 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 I, I probably went overboard on this, but I'm just going to show you slide after slide, after slide, example, after example, after example, I want you to know that this is the number one failure mode. I believe it's the number one failure mode for NRCS dams. And it's really where we need to spend probably the most time inspecting and assessing. And wh what is going on? Well, we, we talked about it a little bit already. This is where we have a penetration through the embankment. And this was really, um, it's not something that happened immediately. Sometimes it took time to develop and engineers were kind of baffled with this. So they started modifying how they were placing the conduit through the dam. They said, obviously the seepage along the conduit is what's causing the problem. So they started putting in anti-seep collars to make this flow path more difficult. And then they said, well, we're having a hard time compacting underneath the conduit as well. So we're gonna fill that in with concrete and have a concrete cradle. That'll make compaction a lot easier. So now we have a concrete cradle and we have anti-seep collars, but the problem didn't go away. 
And so what is the problem? Well, uh, Yogi Berra would say we made too many wrong mistakes, but it really is a little more complicated than that. One, one is we actually took a step backwards when we started building the anti-seep collars because now we created an obstacle course. It made it very difficult to place fill and compact it around the conduit. So that was a problem. The other thing is now these anti-seep collars are hardened features that don't move with the soil and the soil is settling around them. So that creates uh, uh, other problems. And we talked about these, but the number one reason was these cracks that were developing above the conduits because of differential settlement. I believe that's the number one reason why we had so many problems, but it, it was a comedy of all this. So between 1974 and 1987, all these federal agencies, the Corps of Engineers, the NRCS and the Bureau of Reclamation, they said, we're gonna stop building anti-seed collars around our conduits. And instead we're going to put filter diaphragms around them. So where there's a penetration through the embankment, we want that sand filter diaphragm completely around our conduit, unless it's founded on bedrock and then you don't need to have it through the bottom. But here's an example. And you think in most cases that filter diaphragm consists of ASTM C33 fine aggregate or concrete wash sand. And these are just pictures of where they're putting, building that filter diaphragm around a conduit. So you can see here it is from left to right and then going downstream. Some other things that we learned is we want to make sure that we have a nice wide trench on either side of the conduit. We want to have the sides of the concrete cradle or the conduit sloping. Uh, we want to make sure that, that the joints can articulate and uh, we want a rounded top to avoid that stress concentration if, from differential settlement. And then most importantly, no seepage collars and use a filter diaphragm. So what's wrong with this one? Uh, not enough room to provide compaction. There's no concrete cradle, so it's very hard to compact underneath the conduit. We're gonna talk about corrugated metal pipes. Uh, we have anti-seep collars. So there's a lot going on here that we wouldn't do. What should you do? This is, this is one that's been constructed and now they just have to build the embankment around it. So we have a concrete cradle, we have the rounded top, we have lots of room to uh, compact. You don't see it, but it will have a, a full um, filter diaphragm around it so that there, there's no seepage path that's unfiltered. Another big one is overtopping. And this is mainly because of two things. One is when in the 1948 to about 1980, we didn't understand uh, probable maximum precipitation. We didn't have hydrometeorological reports. And once we got that information, we realized that uh, sometimes we underestimated the rainfall. But the other one has to do with um, hazard creep. You know, uh, more and more dams. What was the number? It was just under 40 a year um, because of development downstream. The spillway discharge requirements are increasing. What happens when an embankment dam is overtopped? You can see they're not designed to be overtopped. Uh, this is what happened in Pennsylvania in 1997. Um, 39 people died when this dam was overtopped and breached. If you look more recently, Hurricane Joaquin down to South Carolina in 2015, 52 dams failed during one single event. And uh, you know, there's an example of one of them after it was overtopped and it breached. And the, the lesson learned is probable maximum precipitation really can happen. And during that three day period, they had rainfalls that exceeded 24 inches per hour. So I'd like you to think about this. Sometimes you, you go to a public meeting or you're trying to explain to um, the people that have to maintain the dam that your dam needs to pass 36 inches of rainfall in 24 hours. And they say three feet of rain in 24 hours, that's impossible. But for most NRCS dams, that's not really what you need to focus on. Because the time of concentration, which is the time it takes for the drop of water in the farthest part of the watershed to make its way all the way to the reservoir is not 24 hours. It's, it's usually somewhere around an hour. So it's really what happens in an hour that matters. Uh, and that rainfall intensity is what you need to look at. Here's a world record 
in Missouri, 12 inches of rain fell in 42 minutes. That, that was in, in somebody's rain gauge in their backyard. This was a federal climate station. And they actually recorded 12 inches of rain in 42 minutes. If you look at what happened in Texas uh, during Harvey in 2017, they had 65 inches of rain fall during that seven day period, 65 inches. I mean, that's, that, that's up to my nose if I'm standing up. Would you rather have 65 inches of rain in seven days or 12 inches of rain in 42 minutes at your site? Well, let's put that in different terms. Would you rather have, if this rain fell uniformly over these periods, would you rather have less than one inch per hour or 17 inches, greater than 17 inches per hour. So it's really not the amount of rainfall that's critical in most cases, it's the rainfall intensity. And so I, I just thought that would, would be of interest. Here's a nice graphic that's in the um, Larry Caldwell's report, and it shows the 100 year 24 hour rainfall. And you start in the Southeast part here, the red zone down in the panhandle of Florida, 16 to 23 inches for the 100 year 24 hour. The blue is 10 to 15. And then we get into the majority, about 10,000 NRCS dams is between seven to 10 inches, which is the pink zone here. And then as you go further to the north and the west, uh, you get more to the arid regions. Now, seepage and internal erosion into corrugated metal pipes. Uh, is a real problem. These pipes deteriorate with time. Uh, you, you get these very high CP gradients from the reservoir. There's a short flow path and you can lose the embankment into the conduit. And then you lose the reservoir and the embankment. So if you saw seepage like this, uh, whether it was a concrete pipe or corrugated metal pipe, that is a serious problem with the dam because that seepage can carry embankment material that's what happened at Nelson's Perch Pond in North Dakota. Um, the, the farmer saw that he was having a internal erosion problem. So he went out, got some field stone and filled it in. And then he came out and it didn't solve the problem. And so what was the problem? Well, you can see the corrugated metal pipe in the bottom. And when they, they investigated it, they could see all kinds of perforations and they took it and turned it over and you can see the whole bottom was rusted out. And as we saw, there's about 19% of NRCS dams have corrugated metal pipes. The other factor, you combine that with the fact that the average age of an NRCS dam is now 54 years old, um, we've got a confluence of critical events. Uh, Larry said that over half, 57% of dams with corrugated metal pipes, which represents 1,293 NRCS dams in 21 states, are more than 50 years old. The oldest dams with corrugated metal pipe uh, principal spillways are 74 years old as of 2022. Uh, for time's sake, I won't go through this, but this is a resource for you. If you wanna know how long a corrugated metal pipe, what is the service life? It's a function of three variables. The gauge of the steel used to make the pipe, the resistivity of the soil, and the pH of the soil. If you have those three variables, you can use this chart to ballpark it. And just to, to understand resistivity, drinking water falls within this range of blue. Seawater is way over here. So if you have brackish water or something, you're somewhere in between. But just take a look at the y-axis, zero to 50 years. Uh, it doesn't go beyond that. So um, it, as our dams age, this becomes more critical. The other Paul, one- uh, Paul, I okay. know that we're uh, getting close to a break here, but uh, we had a, a question related to the conduit center line. Uh, and, and you covered that a few minutes ago. Uh, should mm -hmm. the conduit center line go through the dam perpendicular? Would an angled conduit increase the seepage flow path? I've heard arguments uh, for both cases, said Stephen. I don't think it matters as long as you have a filter diaphragm around that conduit, that's the defensive measure that's important. The angle of the conduit, I don't think that really matters too much. Thanks, Paul. And I, I do recognize 
Um, we're heading towards a, a break here and we're almost done uh, the first part. So hang on. Um, th this is uh, my favorite video for talking about rodent activity. This was a dam, it was a homogeneous earth embankment. It was 90 years old and they were experiencing a flood of record and the engineers that were there as the seepage occurred through the downstream phase of the dam, you notice it's not being overtopped. They saw rodents running out of the top of the dam. Uh, and then eventually that led to breaching and failure of the dam. This was one in Nevada and it resulted in $50 million worth of damages. You know, our flood control dams are there to protect people, not to create a problem downstream. Now this was not an NRCS dam. And the Bureau of Reclamation went in and they did something really interesting. They took a section of the dam that had not failed, but that had rodent activity on it. And they, they pumped an expanding foam into the rodent holes. And you can see the path that that foam took. So that polyurethane foam, and they were mapping out the network of burrows into this dam. And then they, they got really smart and they said, let's put a, a fluorescent orange dye in the foam so that it will pop out. And you can just see the network uh, from upstream to downstream of rodent holes uh, through it. So we'll talk a little bit about that, about inspection findings for NRCS dams after the break. And then the last one is erosion and breaching of the auxiliary spillway. That's gonna be our feature uh, this afternoon. But, but now that these we have 70 years of experience and almost all of these dams have um, earth cut grass line spillways, some of them when they get activated, uh, we're surprised at how uh, erodible some of these are. Now, the good news is most of them have performed well. And I, I, I don't want to spoil this afternoon's part, but a lot of the reasons why these spillways are not performing well, and what you see is a complete breach of the dam, not through the embankment, but through the spillway here, is because they're not being maintained or because they're being modified. And so we're gonna look at that. And I, I, I just thought I'd end with this one, with Danny, the late Danny McCook said, Paul, uh, this surprised him, it surprised me. And now I look for this too. You know, what, what can happen in NRCS dams? This was a dam in Oklahoma. It, it, the auxiliary spillway actually worked fairly well. It didn't erode and breach, but it was the exit flows that once they left the spillway, they encountered some feature downstream, rather going straight under the bridge and out, it formed an eddy at the toe of the dam. It could have been because of the vegetation. It could have been because of the highway downstream. But look what happened to the embankment. It, it just chewed a big hole in the downstream face of the embankment. So here now we're standing on the crest of the embankment. You can see the brown reservoir that's fairly high. And had it persisted, uh, that could have been a catastrophe. You know, that could have resulted in the uncontrolled release of the stored water. Look how close that came. Uh, so that's just one more um, thing to be aware of. So um, Ray, if it's okay, I think we're good for a, a 10 minute break. Absolutely, uh, everyone set your timer for 10 minutes. Don't miss uh, the second part of Paul's presentations. Uh, uh, I can hear the round of applause already, Paul, out there for some of this phenomenal uh, work and material that you've put together for us today. And so don't miss a, be a beat. Also, you want to make sure that uh, you make note of uh, Paul is willing to stay after for a post webinar uh, discussion too uh, for anyone that's interested. So, Tim. And Ray, I, I should have mentioned it, but if you look at the lower left hand or the right hand corner of every slide, there's a number. Yeah. So, if, if at the end of this you want to talk about something in specific and said, Paul, you know, on slide number 167, you had this, can we go back to that? That's a way you can take notes. It, or you could download the whole presentation and look for that number as well. Uh, excellent. Excellent point, Paul. So we'll look forward to uh, coming back. Thanks to all of you that are using the questions and answer uh, dashboard on your Zoom dashboard. Keep that open. You'll be receiving the questions and the answers to uh, some of the questions that have came in. Thanks so much, folks. See you in 10 minutes.
Ray, I'm ready to go in about, it seems like our 10 minutes will be up in about one minute. Will that work? You bet, Paul, it sure will. And we've got a question or two here that we can pose to you as you begin. Uh, go ahead. Begin here in a minute or so. Appreciate everyone. Uh, let me just make a plug for all of you that are using the questions and answer dashboard instead of the chat today. It sure is uh, working well for us. And I want to thank uh, those that have been able to aid us in some of the questions in locations of dams and locations of state offices and that sort of thing. Very helpful to us. And uh, so we're right up against that one minute mark. We've got people, I'm sure, just coming back. And uh, it is outstanding the, the kind of questions that we've been receiving and, and invite you to do more. Again, a reminder that Paul has offered that uh, after a short break, after our three hour webinar, he's willing to stay on and, and answer other questions or have a discussion with you too. Uh, he noted yeah, that- I, I, I was able to run out and check the smoker. Things are- Things are, are coming along? Fine. Yeah, yeah. Good, good. Yep, the, well, the ribs look good. We got about 168 of your closest friends that are probably making their way over to your place. So just, you know, just to make sure you know. <laughs> I, I, I wish I could. Us? I'd love to have everybody over. That'd be great. <laughs> In the meantime, you and your family can just celebrate a successful webinar then at that point. Okay. Well, we're right up against that 10 minute mark. Uh, thanks for that break, Paul. Very much appreciated. Our question comes from Alton and it goes like this. So what is the best way to compact the filter drain fill around the principal spillway? Is it mechanical, flooding by water, et cetera? Yeah, mechanical is mechanical. the ideal way to do it, yes. Okay. Nothing to add to that, just mechanical is best way, huh? Okay. Okay. All right, Paul, back to you then. Thank you. All right. Well, let's move on here and kind of take what we learned so far and take it a little step further, common inspection and assessment findings. I think you know the answer to some of these already, but we're gonna pretend we're going out to all kinds of different NRCS dams. And I'm gonna show you some things that we found during inspections. And then some things that we found, you know, when you peel away the onion and you look a little bit deeper. But now that we know the history and, and some of the issues, but let's take a deeper dive. So inspecting, if you came across uh, your dam and this is how you're maintaining the crest, you know, this is uh, a potential problem. You have loss of control of the crest. You know, do you have enough freeboard? Um, this would be a deficiency. And when you're looking for, you know, the top of the dam is, is kind of a sacred area. You don't want to lose it. And you could lose it for a number of reasons. It could be because of livestock, going up and over and forming paths over the 70 years or 54 years or, or however long the dam has been in operation. It could be because of grading the top. It could be because of tire ruts and things like that. So you wanna make sure that that crest does not change with time. Something else is uncontrolled vegetation. Uh, the rule is there should be absolutely no woody vegetation anywhere within the footprint of the dam and even beyond. And we'll talk about that. Uh, it looks like this dam owner actually planted these deliberately along the crest for aesthetic reasons. But what's the problem with that? Well, these, these big trees have roots. Uh, the trees will die with time and the roots will decay and those will form flow paths. Uh, but probably before that happens, uh, you'll get the tree blown over. It'll create a big divot in the top. That's what happened at this dam that wasn't being maintained. You can see the roots penetrating the embankment, just not a good deal. And then it blows over. If, if, you're, just, if you're interested, this is information we just, uh, you know, Dan and I, um, um, you know, there's so much stuff we wanted to share with you. Uh, th th this is just a table that shows the tree diameter, the root ball diameter, and how deep uh, or wide the root system will spread. Some of these trees have root systems that go horizontal or laterally. And others have, and, and when they roll over, you can see this one rolled over, it can take a big divot uh, with it. Others have very deep tap roots. You know, this is one that's got a 14 inch diameter, but that tap root goes down 12 feet. And so that, that 
different kind of vegetation can pose different problems. Looking at the upstream slope, the number one issue there is to line yourself with the reservoir, right where the reservoir meets the embankment. That should be a nice straight line every time because that's how they built the dam. And if you see it going all over the place, chances are if you lower the reservoir, you're gonna see erosion along the upstream crest right at that normal pool line. And that's referred to as beaching. As I was showing you the evolution of embankment dams, the last step in a lot of dams was to go back and armor the upstream slope to avoid this kind of a problem. It's very gradual. It can creep up on you over time and it can result in an upstream slope uh, stability problem. And it just keep getting worse until it, it can create a breach of the dam. Now, some of the other things to be looking at, hopefully you never see anything like this. This is a symptom of internal erosion within the embankment. So this would be the inlet somewhere in the upstream slope of the dam. If you had a sinkhole in a whirlpool like this, uh, you know that would be a cause to activate your emergency action plan and begin lowering the reservoir in a controlled way. So here's another example. Sometimes uh, they can occur above the water line, uh, but more likely it's somewhere below the water. And so you should be, when you're inspecting your dam and maintaining it, you should be looking into the reservoir to see if there is a whirlpool. Now it could be because uh, there's an intake and that, that whirlpool is just above the intake, but if it's not, you know, you could have a sinkhole like this developing. Sometimes these sinkholes aren't on the upstream face, but they can show up on the downstream face like Site 15 in McKinney, Texas. And this one was traced, if you were to line yourself where the penetration of the conduit was, that conduit passed through the embankment right underneath the sinkhole. And so we went in and did a camera inspection of the conduit and sure enough, there's a defect in the conduit right there. And that phreatic surface was draining right into the conduit, but at that location and creating that sinkhole. And obviously you don't want uncontrolled seepage coming out of the downstream face of the dam. You know, that's what that internal uh, chimney drain and seepage collection is for. You want all seepage to be filtered. And at this dam, uh, you could look at the seepage, you know it's not filtered, you know it's uh, carrying um, a sediment, which is part of the embankment because the color of it is a brown or a muddy color. Um, here is, um, um, we were doing, building that, that auxiliary spillway on the downstream slope of Renwick Dam and we, we stripped away all the grass cover on the downstream slope. There were two well-defined horizontal lines of seepage. I got more, go ahead. I got it. Ready? Yeah, we'll comment. Now, what was going on at, at that dam um, was, if you went back to the construction records, and that was in Icelandic State Park in North Dakota. So when they have a winter shutdown, there can be freeze thaw. Again, it loosens up that top layer, and that should have been removed and, and then reworked and then kept construction. So it, you know, it wasn't it, serious, but um, you know, part of the design of that spillway too, underneath the roller combat concrete was to have a filtered drainage system to help address that. Sometimes the seepage isn't through the embankment, it's actually through the foundation or through the overburden. And that's what happened at this dam. And so the seepage exit is somewhere at the toe of the dam because there's a vertical hydraulic gradient there. You've got the embankment that's um, holding things down, but then the path of least resistance is through that horizontal zone of sand or gravel and then it will break through at the toe of the dam and look something like this. So you end up with a boil. Sometimes it's referred to as a sand boil. Um, why? Because it looks like the sand is boiling. So here's one at the toe of a dam where that's occurring. And if you look up, you can see the dam here in the sec. That's, that's the sand boiling. There's the dam, we're at the toe of the dam. And the other thing is uh, that material looks a lot different than anything else around. So that's the actual aquifer material or that horizontal material where the CV is going through. Those are the particles that are getting pushed up and breaking through the surface. 
We already talked about rodent activity. I showed you examples of dams that failed in that network. Uh, this was one we were walking along and counted 13 rodent holes in the crest of the dam. Also in the upstream slope of the dam, you can see it. And uh, the, the next one is a video of probably the worst condition I saw while inspecting a dam of a rodent hole. So I think what was going on here, we tried to figure out how did this hole get to be so big, so deep? And I'll show you what, he's taking a picture and let's see what that picture looks like. That's what it looks like. And we figured out, we think it was a badger that was going in for lunch and the lunch was uh, either a groundhog or um, uh, another rodent uh, that, that was built his home in that part of the dam. But it can show you that if you don't control animal activity, especially rodent activity at the dam, just how bad it is. I think this dam was at a point where it needed to be rebuilt because of that damage. And, and depending upon where you are in the United States, you can have different problems. This one, we identified marmots in the upstream slope crawling all over the riprap. They hired an exterminator and within, or a trapper, and within one season, uh, he removed 180 marmots from the upstream slope of the dam. Just to, there's a, some great reference material out there. FEMA has a guidance document on controlling animal activity at dams. Muskrats are pretty much affecting all NRCS dams, except maybe down in Florida and, and Texas. Uh, but they like to go under the normal pool and then they build their home in the embankment. So you may not see um, a lot of the damage until it, it gets advanced. The same thing with beavers. They'll do the same thing. They'll uh, burrow into the embankment and then build their den above the normal pool, but the entrance will be below the normal pool. Now they're everywhere in the United States. So everybody probably has beaver problems. And then we have groundhog problems, which are mainly in the east. And they like to burrow in from the downstream side, not so much the water side. So if you have both of these types of rodents, some working on the upstream side, some working on the downstream side, you can do the math, you know that there's gonna be a problem. And then there's muskrats, uh, even alligators and um, all kinds of other animals like, they just love these embankments to make their homes in. This isn't so bad, right? And it, it kind of comes down to the question, well, where do you draw the line? How far do you control woody vegetation from the embankment? And, and there is no one answer but it does need to be controlled, not just on the embankment, but beyond the toe of the embankment as well. What if there's seepage? What if there's a boil? How are you gonna see it? And even more important than that, if you did a cross section through this embankment and you said, well, it's a modern embankment, they've got a chimney drain, they've got a blanket drain. And if you went 20 feet beyond the toe of the dam, that would be the limits of this yellow zone here. And just beyond that is what? That's the toe drain. And if you had all this, these trees growing there, I guarantee you, uh, those roots are gonna look for water and they're gonna go into the drain, into the perforations, and they're gonna clog up your drain pipe, which is not good. And when we talk about inspecting and assessing and maintaining these structures, the drain system is a critical function. You know, if you plug the drain, then it's not gonna work. Unfortunately, a lot of these drains are also constructed with corrugated metal pipes. And you can do the same math as with a principal spillway, maybe even worse in this case um, would be uh, you know, doing that. And uh, remember that these drain outlets need animal guards. Uh, I, I don't understand animal behavior. This is, uh, um, we're sharing some of this information with a class and Jim Weigel from the Bureau was at the class. When he got back, he said, I, I, I I went in after the class and we decided to inspect our drains because of some of the issues that you brought up. He said, you wouldn't believe it, but I found a dead beaver at the, within the, the few feet of the entrance of the drain pipe. And then we ran a camera in our drain pipe and we found another dead beaver. He said it was about a hundred feet uh, upstream of the entrance in his drain pipe. Uh, another classmate, um, immediately went out on his drains and put these animal guards on, not realizing that there were occupants in his drain. And then he went out on another day and he found that uh, he had actually locked one of the rodents in the drain itself. Wow. 
So, so listen, uh, as we talk about the rodents and the animal damage, Paul, a uh, question came in and I want to loop back on another question. So two questions here. Uh, first one is what tools are used to diagnose uh, the extent of these animal holes? Probes, x-rays, sonar? What have you seen that uh, can work there? Um, smoke bombs are pretty good where you put a smoke bomb in and then you seal the exit and then you take a probe and you keep probing from the surface and trace the extent of the path of the uh, rodent. Um, the, 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 the best advice I can give you is control the population early. And as soon as you see animal damage, that's when you repair it. But if you've had animals um, burrowing in on your embankment for years and years and years, uh, I like what the course says. It's not a matter of, well, let's just throw some fill in at the entrance and pack it in and, and we're done. Uh, they say, especially for levy maintenance, and it's, it should be no different for dams, you need to restore the embankment to its original condition. Mm -hmm. So it really depends upon the animals that are burrowing into your dam, how long they've been burrowing into your dam, and the extent of the damage. Now, where I would focus most of my attention is on the crest of the embankment, where the embankment is narrowest. If you have an embankment that's 100 feet high, you know, animal damage along the toe is more of a nuisance. It's not going to affect the structural integrity of the dam. Uh, but if you have a very small dam and it's a lot of animal activity, then there's a lot less room uh, for the burrows to, you know, to interconnect. So it's a hard question to answer. Mm -hmm. But uh, this, is, this is the real answer is go to the FEMA guidance document on controlling animals around dams. They also talk about uh, what to do. But the bottom line is you need to restore the embankment to its original condition, whatever that means. And there is no simple, let's just pump it full of concrete or grout or something. Um, I'm not aware of any simple solution that, that that is that easy. You may have to do some digging and compacting. I think you covered uh, another question that we had there uh, regarding you know, the damage by animals and uh, where people can get information on that. Uh, this is, I'm going to switch gears with you, Paul. This goes back a little few slides. Is there any guidance on rating the interior condition of circa 1970 pre-stressed concrete pipe? And she gives a, um, or Tracy gives a note here, AWWA C301, mm -hmm. right? 301, Principal yeah. Principal pipes that could inform when lining should be considered. That's a wonderful question. And I've got a slide coming up that just talks about that. Okay. Okay. So if, if we could hold off on answering that question, I'm going to get to it in just a bit. Sounds good. Thanks, Paul. All right. Great questions. Keep them coming. So the the modern drain, when, when the NRCS started putting drainage systems in embankments, nobody ever looked 50 years into the future and thought we would have these wonderful cameras that can propel themselves and do inspections. I mean, it, it just, it hadn't been invented. Nobody thought of it. Uh, now we know about it. And so the, the current standard is to design these drains with cleanouts. And so at the upstream end, you have a sanitary sweep that daylights through the surface of the ground. So you have easy access to the upstream end of it. And that means you can put a conduit, uh, not a conduit, but a camera. You can put a push camera through it or a crawler camera. And it also gives you access to clean it out if you want to um, flush it out or run a sewer snake through or something like that. So that is, uh, here's what just one of many different configurations could look like at the toe of the dam. So you, you pull that off, you have access to your drain. You can run the camera through, you can see what the condition is and you can flush it out if needed as well. As I mentioned, these corrugated metal pipes, they have limited life. Um, you get iron precipitates. You, know, you, you may not get anything, any roots or sediment in there, but just the groundwater interacting with the oxygen can precipitate uh, deposits in your conduit. And so you, it could be completely filled up with, uh, we call, call it iron precipitate or yellow boy, or these pudding-like consistency deposits that will clog your drain. So drains need to be maintained. So here's the downstream slope of a dam. This one's looking pretty good, uh, you know, and they created a nice 
buffer zone at the toe, a minimum of 20 feet more, depending upon the kind of trees and, and where your toe drain is. Uh, looking at riser structures, remember these are confined spaces. And unfortunately, uh, there are cases of inspectors and others. This was a dam inspector and he was not following confined space entry procedures and he died uh, as a result of his injuries here at this riser structure. And I'm gonna play a video next. And this is an NRCS dam where uh, the inlet of the riser structure got clogged. Now this was only four feet in four feet of water and they hired a local diver uh, to go in and unclog it. And what they should have done is equalize the pressure from the downstream side with the pneumatic plug. And you'll see that's ultimately what they did, but I'll let the video play. And it's just, if you're going to hire somebody to help you, if your riser structure gets obstructed, uh, make sure they follow, they know what they're doing. It's very hazardous. Again, this is only four feet of water and uh, we don't want this to happen. After a 30-hour recovery effort, the family of diver Larry Coach can now rest a little easier tonight. Coach's body has been recovered. East Texas News 9's Jenna Johnson was in garrison all day and has this report. It's a difficult work environment, murky water, low visibility, and an intense suction. It was um, a lot of unknowns. The body of Larry Coach was lodged in a 24-inch pipe. For two days, rescuers worked to bring his body to the shore. It wasn't easy. The water pressure was relentlessly holding Coach inside the pipe. And then we figured out that his, his uh, BCD, or his buoyancy control device, and his regulator and tank was hung up inside the hole with him. So I took that off, and when I, when I did that, it was uh, pretty it freed him. It was a team effort. Technology was brought in. Video cameras were used to pinpoint his location. That should be him right there. You're up against something. That should be him right there. Can you back up just a little bit now? Rescue divers face the exact conditions that took Coach's life. We were, we were all tethered. We had people on shore ready to yank us out because we were poking from fire poles down in there trying to locate him, and the suction was trying to suck the poles out of our hand. And so it's, it's very dangerous to get anywhere near that drain. There was a need to equalize the pressure. They cut off the flow of the water on the pipe's other end. When we finally got the flow of the water shut off, it became a little easier, a lot easier. But with the flow of that water, it was uh, very hard, scary. <laughs> but these dedicated rescuers were not giving up until the job was done. In Garrison, Jenna Johnson, KTRE East Texas News 9. As I mentioned, there has never been a fatality from a dam, NRCS dam failure. Unfortunately, there have been fatalities uh, like this one and others uh, just because of, and the riser structure falling in and things like that, uh, just because of people not recognizing, you know, the confined space and the special procedures that are needed to work around some of these structures. So uh, some of the other things that are obvious, uh, a tilting riser structure, could be a sign of distress, uh, differential settlement or erosion of the foundation. These structures need to be maintained. You know, they're, they're not self-cleaning. They're, they're very effective at preventing debris from getting into the conduit, but they also need to be maintained. Um, I, this is, um, Meg Galloway from Wisconsin sent me this and it, I, it just dawned on me that it, it's so obvious now once you see it, but the farmers around the uh, stream, upstream of the reservoir, uh, he went out and did all his haying and rolled up all the bales and stored them right along the creek and in the floodplain. And then when they had the flood, it, uh, it floated all of these hay bales and the riser structure got completely engulfed with the hay bales and that caused the reservoir to go up. And then the hay bales made their way over to the auxiliary spillway and concentrated the flow to one side of the auxiliary spillway and almost breached the spillway because of the concentrated flow. Um, this was an example of, um, of an algae problem in a reservoir at an NRCS dam. And the algae got so thick the, that it formed a blanket. And you can see that it completely obstructed the entrance of the riser structure. Here's an example of why we inspect conduits. So the riser structure, uh, 
it's be completely full of woody debris. And what was happening was the beavers downstream were cutting branches and then they were carrying them through the downstream opening of the conduit all the way up through the conduit about 300 feet and then filling up the riser structure. There was no way of knowing what was going on. You could look at the riser structure, it looked great. You could look at the outlet, it looked great. It wasn't until we went inside the conduit that we found what the beavers were doing, you know, seven days a week, 24 hours a day, uh, filling up that riser structure. This is one that uh, Mark McCurdy from Iowa NRCS sent me. He said, Paul, have you ever seen this before? And he, he was trying to figure out what's going on. And what I speculate happened here was that a beaver plugged the entrance of the conduit, caused the, the water to drain out and fill with air, made it buoyant, and then it floated to the surface. So I think that was probably more beaver damage at that one. Sometimes it's not beavers, sometimes it's, it's uh, uh, trespassers. And uh, this one here, this is just that 18 inch diameter riser structure. I took a look down and it, the bottom three feet were completely filled with this kind of rock. So it looked like kids were coming along and they do what kids do. They were just dropping it down to see what would happen. And over time, uh, you know, the, the conduit was completely obstructed with these rocks that were being dropped in the riser structure. So how do we inspect these? And I think that that is a question that was just asked and how do we know how long they last, and things like that. Uh, fortunately, we don't have to crawl in them anymore. We have these great ROVs. They can even work when there's water flowing in. This is that New Creek 14. And we were replacing the old riser structure, but uh, the old riser structure had a leaking gate. And uh, when the uh, operator of the ROV came and said, I'm not sure we're going to be able to do this, he said, no problem. And all he did is he took the wheels off of his ROV and put on bigger wheels. He said, we'll just uh, drive over the flow. And that's what they did. Um, really nice equipment out there now. They basically have these mobile offices and they sit there and they have the attendant down it that, that inserts it and, and says, all right, we're at zero and he zeroes it. And then they start driving it up the conduit. And as they go, uh, they can pan, tilt, zoom, and they take a continuous video. They can look at every joint, look for every crack, see if any of the joints are open, see if the pipe is deflected or dipping or offset or anything like that. And uh, great equipment. What do you find when you're in these conduits? Um, this was one where after we did the video, the engineer came, Paul, he said, what's going on here? We've got, do we, do we put trash racks inside of conduits? And the answer is no, no, we want the conduits completely open. And this was a dam that was built in the 60s. And it was the first time that it had been video inspected in 2016, so many years later. And we traced it back to the construction photos where the contractor left the form in for the opening at the riser. Uh, so glad we found that, we were able to take that out. Um, now, now we're getting into serious problems. This, the most common occurrence where you have these offsets is where the pipe meets the riser. The riser usually has a deeper foundation, is often founded on bedrock, if it's fairly shallow. And meanwhile, the conduit is up higher and it passes through the embankment, which is compressible. So right at that interface, there's the potential for differential movement. And if the joint isn't designed to accommodate that at that location, uh, you can get this. That's usually when we do a video inspection, that's what I'm most interested in, is what does that interface between the conduit and the riser look like? And obviously something like this is serious and you're into um, some, some significant repairs. Now the corrugated metal pipes, you know, they deteriorate with time, their strengths deteriorate. And uh, so there's, there's the metal itself that can deteriorate and then they can also deform. So those are the two issues with the corrugated metal pipes and their limited life. But then with the concrete pipes, we're also interested in uh, the joint openings. And this kind of gets to the answer to that question. And I, this is where I, I think we have over 300 people participating in this webinar. And I know some of them probably know a lot more about this than I do. There's a lot of experts on, on that I saw signed up. But this is one of the studies that I went to. This is one that was done for the NRCS uh, by the University of, uh, by Kansas State University. 
And they went out and they looked at a number of NRCS principal spillway conduits to answer the question, how are they holding up over time? And they looked at corrugated metal pipes. They look at the C3071, the C301 pipe. And uh, I'm not gonna read all of this to you, but what they found in their sampling of pipes was that the corrugated metal pipes and the C76 pipes did not perform well. The corrugated metal pipes have limited life, they corrode and, and so on. The C76, um, all kinds of leaks at the joints, a lot of them had cracks, they just don't hold up to the loads. The C301 pipes performed well. Of all the pipes, they performed the best. Um, I would like to get more information, but most of the rehabilitation projects I've worked on, we found that these pipes can, their service life goes beyond the 50 year life. And you know who knows how long, but it may be another 50 years. Uh, where I've seen the most damage is that last stick of pipe at the outlet that's exposed to the weather. And that's usually the, the worst um, section of pipe. The pipe that's actually in the embankment is somewhat protected from weathering and it, it seems to be performing very well. So I don't have a full answer on what is the service life of these conduits. If anybody else would like to answer or comment on it, maybe you could type it in the chat if there's a better study, but this is the best study that I have so far uh, besides my own experience that, that seems to indicate that it's, it's performing really well. And now we're getting to the last part of the um, webinar. And I'd like to just focus on one part of NRCS dams that appear to have been neglected the most, in my opinion, over time. And that's the earth cut auxiliary spillways. And there's a lot of things that can happen. And some of it, you know, you can do a great job maintaining the spillway and still have a problem. Here, for example, is one where I, I wish I, I was looking for the original photo of when this spillway was constructed and the project was put into service. I couldn't find it. But when we inspected it at the entrance of the spillway, you can see trees are growing between the reservoir and the entrance of the spillway. Uh, they probably started the day the project was put into service. The, the um, maintenance staff were doing a wonderful job mowing and maintaining the grass cover, but that one zone between the reservoir and the entrance of the spillway, they let grow with trees. And this would keep growing, growing, eventually you have a thick forest. What you're doing is you're blocking the entrance of the spillway. It can accumulate debris. And although the control section is further upstream, um, this is not good. You know, it, and so the, the, the observation was to go in and to remove that and keep the path open uh, between the reservoir and the entrance of the spillway. Again, just like uh, all this hazard creep of development downstream of the dam, we're even seeing it now. Things are, are these spillways are being modified uh, with access roads and used for storage and for all kinds of different reasons. Even people are planting stuff on. Um, here's one where the farmer would take his, he was, he couldn't get over the spillway training dike uh, to get onto the crest of the dam to get to his field beyond. So he built a ramp right there. Well, he essentially built a ramp on the crest of the spillway and obstructed the control section. This is the control section. And by doing that, reduced the capacity of the spillway probably by about 25% and also the flow hydraulics. So now he's concentrating the flow along the left side of the spillway. He solved his problem, but created another problem. Probably didn't fully understand what was going on. Here's another case where uh, the spillway is being used as a storage area and they're putting waste fill and other things you know, in the exit channel and that will get overgrown. And now you've got limited, the, the control will shift from where it was designed to the pinch point downstream. Um, as I mentioned, I think some people don't even realize that the auxiliary spillway is a feature of the dam. This was at a Corps of Engineers um, depot, Army depot, and they had a, a classic NRCS type dam, riser structure, embankment, and auxiliary spillway. 
and they went and deliberately planted trees in the spillway and they even put up a sign future forest but my favorite is this one this was in south carolina uh, during uh what was uh joaquin hurricane joaquin in 2015 uh, the state it was uh, it was like the worst drought uh, not drought but the worst flood of record they were having a thousand year rainfall and they dispatched about a hundred of their state workers to babysit all these dams. And then we had a training session afterwards and uh, one of the, the, um, the, the, the participants said, Paul, uh, this is what I saw when I went to this dam. There was a for sale sign here and this homeowners association that had this dam with an earth cut grassland spillway were in the process of selling the vacant lot as uh, another space for developing the home. Fortunately, he was able to tell them that this was an auxiliary spillway and they shouldn't be doing that. Now, I, I was saying that, um, how are these spillways performing? Are they performing the way the designers expected them to? And in some cases they're not. Now, the, most of these spillways still have not been activated because they have a 1% chance any year to even have flow going through them. But now we are starting to see more and more of them activated after 72 years. And in many cases, they perform exactly as intended, but in other cases, they have not. And you can see this one was an emergency. The head cutting through the spillway was about 40 feet, and it's in the process of breaching the dam right through the spillway. So that, that's not what you want to see your a grass cut spillway doing. Um, these are wonderful pictures. This is a spillway that has just started to be activated. And it, if, you, if you look at this long enough, you can start connecting the dots. There's a few things going on. One is look at all the ATV tracks and that's where the crest of the spillway is lowest. So the flow is gonna concentrate there first. Rather than going over the whole spillway uniformly, it's flowing down there first and it's following the tracks and then it's even coming down here and there are bare spots and you can see where the damage is starting. This is, this is the, the weak point. It's like pulling a thread on a sweater. You know, you find the weak point and it starts eroding downward and then you start getting the head cutting. This was uh, a project where I went out and inspected after the spillway had been activated. Now, clearly it's a rock cut spillway. You can see the rock that was excavated here and they put some topsoil on the top and seeded it more to make it easier to maintain. But what I thought, thought was very interesting is the part of the spillway where there were no tire tracks did not erode. That grass lining held up beautifully. It was only where there were tire tracks that eroded that topsoil and exposed what was below, which in this case was the rock, the bedrock, um, which only resulted in minor damage, so no big deal. But if you don't have bedrock, this is one that's totally in overburden type material. And if you follow this S path here, that's exactly the path where the, the farmer would drive his tractor back and forth through the spillway uh, to get to his fields. And he created tire ruts and a bare spot. And here's the spillway crest. So it ended up breaching the spillway right through there. So it's pretty obvious. if if the spillway was maintained by as it was originally designed, uh, chances are it would not have failed like this. So when you're inspecting your spillway and maintaining it, uh, you try to avoid having anything like this because you've essentially initiated the failure of the spillway already. This is phase one, which is loss of the grass cover. Now, if you are gonna have a footpath, the place to put it is upstream of the control section. That's where the flow is subcritical. Don't put it downstream where the flow velocities are higher. So if you do need a footpath, put it upstream of the control section, not downstream. And we saw you know, what was going here, that's a repeat. Uh, the USDA Agriculture Research Service continues to do excellent research and provide engineers and sponsors with really important information. They were looking at the importance of this grass cover and what happens if you did have a tire track, an ATV track or whatever through it. And I believe they initially ran this test 
um, of this grass lined spillway without the tire track and it did not fail. And then they removed a strip of the sod. And I'm gonna play this video really fast because I think it really shows what's going on. So without that tire track, that's what initiated this erosion and that's what caused this spillway. You can see what's going on and, and how it just uh, unraveled. The other thing is the vegetation spillway. Just because you have vegetation doesn't mean, all vegetation is not equal. Uh, these spillways were designed in many cases to be grass lined and having woody vegetation like brush in there is not good because the flow will concentrate around it and that will accelerate the erosion. You want that uniform, healthy grass cover. Uh, you can see what happens when the flow goes around a bush. It's, it's accelerating, it's turbulent, and it's causing a lot more stress at the root system. And, and, and that's what initiates erosion. I thought this was interesting. This was an embankment dam that was being overtopped. And it showed that the grass cover was doing a great job you know, for the shallow amount of flow is really doing an exceptional job protecting the embankment. But you see where the erosion was initiated. It's where you had the fence and you had these protrusions, and these discontinuities. Um, if you had it nice and uniform and no flow concentration, chances are you wouldn't have had all of this erosion. Now the uh, NRCS and the Agriculture Research Service has developed uh, some world-class tools on how to evaluate these spillways. Now we're getting into the assessment side. And then if you go to the National Engineering Handbook, chapters 50, 51, and 52 um, tell you how to design these spillways, how they need to be maintained, and then how they need to be, how they can be analyzed uh, to determine if they will hold up and could something like this happen uh, to your spillway? Has it been analyzed because chances are, you know, those tools have only been around for about 20 years. And if your dam was built before that, there's a lot of engineering judgment that went into designing these spillways. So they did studies on different kinds of grass and determined how much stress can the grass cover take for different types of grass under different stress conditions, different flow conditions, and they did all of this research. So now they, they know how the grass cover will be formed, assuming there is a healthy grass cover in the spillway and how well it's maintained. So that's basically, and then they realized that uh, th this whole analysis is a function of three different things going on. First is the loss of the grass cover, that's phase one. Then phase two is once you get the exposed earth, you get down cutting or these potholes that can develop. And then you get to phase three, which is there's enough energy to create a head cut. And that, that pothole essentially progress upstream until it completely breaches the dam. And they went out and studied all kinds of spillways, earth cut grass line spillways after they were activated and damaged and developed an incredible database of resources of different rock types and soil types and geologies and uh, you know densities of soils, bean particle diameters, and if you uh, percent of clay, and if you know all of these variables, you can then do an analysis of a spillway. And I'm going to show you just a quick example. But one of the things that I've seen in in doing this analysis, if you were to take the original design information, for example, here's Lake Laura Dam in Virginia, it, it's a fairly nice. Uh, spillway, except for the tire tracks here, I guess. And you can see the training dike and the asphalt drawings show a 2% grade going to a level control section and then a 2% grade. And if you were to do a site analysis with this information, it would show you that this spillway is stable, even for the probable maximum flood design storm. But as you work your way down, you've got to look and say, well, is this really what is in the field. That's what the as built drawings show, but is that what's out there today? And if you go to the downstream end, you'll see that there was a change over time. Somebody built access and they cut into it. And so now you don't have that 2% grade going all the way down to the bottom, like it's shown on the as built drawings. You have a sudden discontinuity. 
So I wonder what this would look like if the spillway was activated. Well, it would look something like this. So now you basically, you don't have any grass cover. You, you already have significant down cutting before the spillway is even activated. Look, this is what the designers expected. If you look upstream, you know, you can see the flow looks nice and uniform. And that's what they expected the flow to look like from the control section down to the valley bottom. But because of this access road, uh, they've already initiated the failure mode in the auxiliary spillway. And this is just, it's, it's, it's skipped right past phase one, right past phase two. And as soon as the spillway is activated, you're basically modeling phase three. So what's really wonderful about this software is it's not kind of a yes or no answer. It's actually doing a, a simulation of the erosion of the spillway as the hydrograph passes through the spillway. Now, what you do is you start by defining the most erodible profile through the spillway, which is normally the section closest to the dam. As you move away from the dam into the hillside, you generally get into more and more shallower bedrock and, and better material. But if you look at this spillway, for example, they've got the topsoil on the top, which is the green layer. You've got the overburden, which is the M2 layer, it's a residual soil. Then they get into a weathered rock, which is the yellow layer, which is a saprolite. And then you get into some transition weathered rock material. And then you start getting into really good rock, M5 and M6. So now we've defined our profile through the auxiliary spillway. Then we could run different hydrographs through there. We can run the 200 year, we can run the 500 year, we can run the 1000 year up to the probable maximum flood and determine what the model will tell us how much damage or erosion to expect. And the nice thing, I think it's a really balanced design. The NRCS says, hey, because of the infrequency of activation of these spillways, it doesn't make sense to design them so that there's no damage. A little bit of damage is okay as long as it doesn't compromise the integrity of the embankment or breach the spillway. So if you can pass the problem maximum flood and have a little damage, it's economical to go back and fix it afterwards. But the key is not to breach the spillway. So that's where this model is very helpful. And I thought it'd be interesting to share with you. We looked at about 100 and I think it was about 120 spillways and we did this sites model where we, we developed that geologic profile and we, we ran the design storm through it. And th this is what, where we ended up. 5% had minor damage, 39% of the spillways exhibited significant damage, 29% almost breached, but they didn't breach, and 27%, so this is the big piece here, um, they breached, which, which is, this would be unacceptable. These would be acceptable, the red one is kind of marginally acceptable, but essentially 27% of the population of these, these spillways, if they were to experience the design flood, would have failed. Uh, what does minor damage look like? Well, the model will show you this. This is minor damage, it's surficial, and that's more like this, where you've got, you might lose the topsoil and the grass, but you got that bedrock erosion resistant layer below. So that's minor damage. What does significant damage look like? Well, the model shows, all right, now you got a, a fairly deep uh, um, head cut developing, but it doesn't progress to the crest. So that's what significant damage might look like. And that's still considered acceptable or something like this, you know, the crest is up here. And as long as they can pass the flood and, and not breach the spillway, that's acceptable. Now we get into almost. So here we're at the crest and it's just, I mean, it, it just about uh, breaches it. So it would be as if this flood occurred, we're right at the crest and then things dried up and the flow stopped. And then we get complete breach and that's what it shows and that's where you end up and that's what we don't want. And uh, that then just another example and there, there are a few examples like that. And um, this is what Larry Caldwell, he actually had some interesting information on the number of auxiliary spillways in the portfolio of NRCS dams. This is the first time I saw this. And so they had a total of 2,051 auxiliary spillways out of their uh, 12,000 spillways that had activated. And some of them 
were less than a foot of flow. Some of them were between a one and two feet of flow, two to three feet or greater than three feet. I don't think any of them experienced their full design flow like the probable maximum flood. They were all much less than that. But what they found was that 16% of them experienced damage that was moderate or severe. And obviously the deeper the, the flow depth that was in there, the more damage except for those greater than three. It seems like it kind of plateaued here, 35% and 33% experienced damage. So I thought this was other meaningful information and it would be good to share with you. And now we're gonna wrap it up and I think we're doing good on time here. Yeah, we're, we're, we're gonna finish right on time. Um, the last part is when and how to engage a professional engineer. Uh, well, let's kind of summarize, what are the sponsor's responsibilities? Because there are some things that the sponsor can do very well themselves but there are other things that, that they may want some help with. Well, the sponsor is responsible for monitoring easement encroachment and hazard creep. And I think we even had somebody ask that question, you know, it, should we be doing this downstream? Well, I think at a minimum, if you see somebody digging a hole at the toe of your dam, putting in a swimming pool, or, or even starting to build houses and stuff like that, um, it, it's probably a good time to, to get involved and see if, that kind of activity can't be discouraged, but it can also change the hazard classification of your dam. So sponsors are responsible to monitor this because it can really affect the consequences and the design standards required for that dam. The second thing is to conduct regular dam inspections. With the right training, um, that's something that the sponsor can do. However, there are some states that require that be done by a professional engineer and that becomes an official document. So now we're starting to get into, this is something you may want some help with. Uh, identifying operating and maintenance needs. Uh, the NRCS has an army of experts, engineers and technicians um, that have pretty much committed their careers to helping maintain these dams. And they're an excellent resource. They even have uh, technical centers like the one in Fort Worth, Texas. Um, developing and updating emergency action plans. That's something that the sponsor can do. The NRCS has sample templates and all kinds of guides and videos and things like that to help you do that. Where you might need help here is developing the inundation maps downstream because that requires some hydraulic analysis to develop the dam break maps. So that's an area where you might need an engineer. Upgrading, rehabilitating the dam when needed. Uh, this is going on beyond maintenance, and you really need to get an engineer like the NRCS or, or a private consultant involved. So let's talk about how do you do that? How do you get a professional engineer and a contractor involved to help you? And, and when do you need it? So as I mentioned, some states require inspection by a professional engineer, and that report ends up being signed and sealed by the professional engineer. And if I had more time, I'd actually show you there, there, whenever a dam experiences an incident or fails, it's, and it's on the news, the first thing the reporter reaches for is the last inspection report. And I've seen some reporters read word for word what the inspection report said in it. So it, it can be a very important document and there can be litigation and stuff like that as a result. So some states require it be done by PE. So you need a, you may want an engineer to help you with that. Uh, when conducting a dam assessment, so the dam is more than 50 years old and you wanna go back and say, does this dam have the right features, defensive measures? Does it meet current design standards? Hydrology could have changed with time. And uh, with the hydraulics, the dam break analysis and things like that, uh, you may want a, so the different disciplines uh, an engineer that specializes in hydrology and hydraulics, maybe an engineer that specializes in geotechnical, slope stability analyses, seepage analyses, liquefaction, earthquake stability, all that kind of stuff. Structural, right? That's more the riser structure, the impact basin, any kind of a structural spillway. And then construction. Is it, some engineers specialize in construction. All different areas where you might want help from an engineer. If you do significant modifications to the dam, in most cases, you'll need 
plans, which are drawings and specifications, and they'll need to be designed by in, under the supervision of a professional engineer. And just like the inspection report, they'll be stamped and sealed. Some states require construction observation certification by PE. In other words, you got a professional engineer to do the design work. They want some assurances that what the engineer designed was actually constructed. And they'll want the engineer to certify that he concurs that the contractor built the modifications per his design. So that will often require some level of inspection by the professional engineer. And then the uh, professional engineer can help you develop specifications and pick a qualified contractor. There are some construction, uh, building dams and, and working in a waterway uh, is a lot different than building a highway or a parking lot or a home. So you, you really want a contractor that can work on diversion care of water, dewatering the site and you know placing fill, compacting fill. These are, are not things that are often done working with water stops in structures. And um, if you're doing a, re, a an assessment report, that's really where you get into a multidisciplinary team of engineers working on that. Um, what are questions to ask when hiring? Well, you, you want an engineer that, that is not only has the education, but is also licensed. That means that they've passed the exams and they are licensed and, and because they're licensed, they can sign and seal your drawings. The other thing is you want an engineer that has experience. I, I just put down a minimum of 10 years experience in dam design, not just 10 years of experience doing engineering, but working on dams. Dams is a specialized area. And uh, unfortunately, a lot of the um, dam designers that built these structures, they're not even alive anymore. There's no school you can go to, and it's really something you learn as you go on the job by being mentored by other dam engineers. Um, the, the engineer should display a basic knowledge of the rules and regulations governing dam design. What, what are appropriate factors of safety? How do you do it? What tools do you use? And both the NRCS, and, and both it, it could be NRCS specific as well. They should know NRCS policies and procedures in their national engineering handbook. And then a specific experience in the problem area. Is it hydrology, hydraulics? Is it a spillway? Is it a riser structure? Then they need structural experience. Is it geotechnical uh, for slope stability, seismic, if you're in a highly seismic area? And you're worried about liquefaction and deformation, things like that. And then once you, um, find an engineer that has the right experience, um, you, as, as part of that, there's different ways to, to find them. One is you put out a request for a proposal, and then you, you can select them based on lowest cost, which would be a fee-based, or you can select them based on most qualified. And in dam engineering, um, I, I think the preferred way to do it to get the best result is to find the most qualified. Essentially, you get what you pay for. And if you do it fee-based, you may get an individual that doesn't have very much work and they're hungry and they're looking for work. And there may be a reason why they don't have a lot of work. They may be the lowest cost, uh, but they may not be the best experienced and, and at the end give you the best value. Most engineers, if you hire based on most qualified or best qualified, um, you know, they will uh, provide the best value and be work with you afterwards once you select them to negotiate a fee. And that's where the NRCS can come in too. They're a resource for you as well uh, to help you through that process if you go down that road. So I think that um, ends the uh, webinar part and we ended about seven minutes early. So we got time for more questions, Dan. That's terrific, and uh, if we can, yeah, if we can uh, have people go ahead and keep on uh, entering your questions as we go along here. Just a reminder, uh, we're going to have a few uh, closing comments here, and then uh, a post-webinar discussion with Paul uh, would occur uh, after a short break. So let's um, let's come back into this and uh, and just. Uh, mm, 
All right. So Paul will pull your slides down, bring the other slides up here and um, move to a couple of just a final things. And what I wanna do is be able to turn the program over to uh, both Lisa and Dan for some uh, closing comments. Let's do that uh, right now. Hang on one second. And Dan and Lisa, let's do a sound check with you. Hello, Ray. Hey there. Doing all right. Okay. All right. Dan, Lisa, a few closing comments, um, and uh, then we'll take a short break and come back to our post webinar. Lisa, would you like to make some comments? Well, I think I think I've lost her. I believe she's headed to Paul's house to sample those ribs. I, after uh, that, or, or she's 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 after that turkey. I think. <laughs> you could good could be. Um, well, I just want to tell you, Paul, how much we uh, appreciate the uh, the work that you put into this presentation and uh, all the information that you assembled. I know a lot of times. Um, when we're looking at an operation and maintenance issue, um, once we once we address the immediate concerns, we often wonder um, how and why uh, something occurred. And I think you have provided an excellent base uh, on uh, on how things evolve on a dam as they age and the things that particularly uh, need some sharp attention. Uh, the Watershed Coalition currently has a working group that's looking at corrugated metal pipe issues, uh, repair and remedial work uh, revolving around those. So uh, your presentation today was timely and certainly certainly focused on some of the issues that the Watershed Coalition is trying to address. Um, so I want to thank you for uh, an excellent job. I appreciate those of you who have uh, who have hung in and hopefully we'll uh, be able to chat with Paul in the next in the next uh, phase of this this event. Uh, I know that it requires uh, taking time away from uh, some work and perhaps if uh, Friday happens to be your non work day, I appreciate you uh, logging in and uh, and participating in the webinar. Um, Again, the Watershed Coalition is here to uh, address the needs of project sponsors and NRCS partners and other, other partners. And if we can be of service to you, uh, please do reach out to us. If you uh, thought the webinar was uh, a good one, and I believe it might be the best one we've, we've had so far, Paul, but if you Thank thought you. it was a good one, um, your praise and comments can go to the address that Ray showed you earlier. If you had a problem or there you have suggestions for improvement, uh, please send those as well because we want to uh, we want to improve the efficiency and improve the quality of uh, of the materials that we try to share. So please do let us know. Uh, with that, uh, if Lisa is out there, uh, I. Welcome her to close things out. Well, we appreciate, Dan, those closing comments. Paul, the amount of material that you gave to us in the just three short hours, it went by very, very quickly. And it was packed full of great information. Folks are using the Q&A uh, system here to indicate their appreciation for your program. Now, I do have about three questions here. Do you want to handle those before we take a quick break? Or do you want to take a quick break and go to the post-webinar? You know, I'm, I'm in good shape, so I, I don't know if I need a break, yeah. 
All right, so let's uh, let's take on the first questions, and then we'll decide, uh, you know, how we want to handle, you know, that uh, quick break uh, for the post webinar. 